And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming camp campaign setting for both 5e and for... Um, core fantasy, known as Dratelia, which meant which managed to get funded in about 14 hours. Congratulations on that. The one and only Drew Whale. How you doing today, man? Pretty good. Glad to be here. Glad glad you could, glad you could come on in, into the, into the temple, and I'm definitely glad that I didn't have to deal with as many time zone shenanigans with you. Uh, that's all right. No worries. <laughs> glad to be here in this most holiest of places. Oh, although ev everybody is always surprised when they when with the prospect of monks drinking, I don't know I don't know why that's such a shock. I don't I don't have a problem with it. We've been making alcohol and doing this shit for thousands of years. I don't see why it should be a problem for monks. They got enough problems they got to deal with. Well, there's there's mo there's monks in Belgium and, and elsewhere where they do where they do brew their own beer. Well, how the hell are we supposed to get the drunken fighter? archetype if we don't have the drunken part. That is true. I rest my case. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll start with the humble beginnings in a sense. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, shit. Uh, high school, which is a long time ago now. Uh, I'd say I was about 13, 14, which uh, I'm 38 at the moment, so damn, a long time ago. Uh, but yeah, I, I first started in role-playing in 3.0, when I was introduced to it just at the tail end of whenever 2 was ending itself, mm -hmm. and I had the classic uh, high school teacher who wanted to start an after-school program and get some some more theater kid style uh, students into doing extracurricular activities that weren't jank. You know, I, I, I was not a sports type like the majority of people in this hobby, and they didn't really have anything for us. So this this guy just said, hey, do you, you guys want to play some role-playing games? And I was like, I don't know what the hell that is, but sure. And so I show up after school. There's a couple of other kids similar to me, kind of nerdy, kind of socially awkward, and uh, this guy busts out a treasure trove of books and all of those pewter miniatures that you, you see in the the pictures where people on Reddit are like, look what I found, all this, this old shit. And yeah, I seriously, he had every single one of them. He, he organized them into a fishing tackle box, and I was like, what's this? And they're like, that's an owl bear. And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck that is. And I'm like, what's this? I'm like, that's a that's a demon. I'm like, all right, cool. Let's let's do some shit. And I spent the next couple of years learning how to play 3.0. And very quickly, I learned I'm not a player. I'm not a player. I I didn't enjoy it half as much as the idea of telling the stories. So I asked him. I'm like, hey, can I do what you do? Can I can I tell the stories? And he was like, yeah. And so he taught me everything I know about how to be a good DM, and I've been doing that ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> with that with that in mind, one particular question that I've I've come to I've come I've come to a I've come to ask it usually is the origin story of a of a given idea because some because there's always something that spar that sparks it. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I know that I know that on the Kickstarter page it mentioned, I think you you had mentioned that your own disability what was one of the was one of the inspirations. But was Dratelia a camp a campaign setting that you had been had been had been developing and playing it and playing with your given table for for a good amount of time, or was there a di was there a different point of origin? They happened around the, the same time. So I was looking for an excuse to DM uh, a new campaign, and I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. And I start thinking, okay, well, um, I'm going to make a new world, but I have no idea what it's going to be. 
And so I, repro- I approached my normal play group and I was like, all right, I've got the, the, the basic seed of this idea, but you're going to have to trust me because I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. And we're, we're going to play test this and hopefully you like it. And if it does any good, maybe it can develop into something a little bit more. But at the time, I had really no idea what direction I was going to take it with it. And so I started out with the most bare bones of ideas. I flushed out just enough to get the ground laid for actually playing the game. Uh, shout out to Lazy Dungeon Master's Guide for the spiral method of helping every lazy DM like myself have stuff ready. And around that time, I was like, okay, I want to do something more with this. I I have just enough where I feel like I can add something to it, kind of like that, that special sauce, but I'm not sure what that is, which I know a lot of DMs face. And then I was like, okay, what if I make it similar to my own problems? Because every setting needs some sort of conflict. Every setting needs something that's in, intrinsically wrong with it for the the players to come in and fix. And the first idea that, that came from it was these giant land waves. And the land waves are based on my own tremors. Part of my disability is I have the um, myoclonus, which is where my body will do some sort of like a mini seizure. It's not really a seizure, but it's, it's part of chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, kind of if I overdo it and I go past my energy envelope, I kind of spaz out a little bit. Like, my body does a little bit of uncontrollable stuff, and it's not too bad. It's not nearly as bad as, say, somebody with epilepsy. Um, But it's right in my core, and I'll spaz out for a little bit, and then it'll calm down as I rest. And I was like, okay, what if an entire planet did that? What if if an entire planet had uncontrollable giant tremors? And then from there, kind of everything just fell into place. The more ideas that I, I took from my illness kind of set in like Tetris blocks. They fit really well as I tried to find mechanics that represented some of the stuff that I have to go through. Like um, when I overexert myself, everything gets uh, really heavy and I get really tired and I have to rest. I was like, okay, what if the the interior of the planet does the same thing? Mm-hmm. And everything just kind of fell into place. With I, I went through my entire list of symptoms all the problems that I have to deal with, all the the ways that I overcome those problems, and they all ended up becoming mechanics. And I'm like, all right, well, if I have a tremor, then what's wrong with the giant 100-foot land wave that wrecks every city? And then from there, you go on to, okay, how do people deal with that? What would life be like if you had to deal with that? What kind of solutions do these societies have to make that solve these problems? And it it just kind of snowballed. Mm -hmm. So... Are you familiar with the concept of Appendix N? I'm not. Fill me in. The Appendix N was a is a is a section that was in the that was in um very early D and D D and D that was a collection of um of of other media that that could serve as inspiration or re- or reference or in some cases di- some cases did for the for the writers. Um. And I'm curious if I'm curious if you were if you were to fill in the appendix N for your for your work, um, what's what sort of things would be in it? Whether it be whether it be books, whether it be games, whether it be television, whether it be film. Can you be... give me an example so I can feel like I'm better equipped to give your listeners something substantial? Um, like what would what would be in a, in, in an appendix N, for example? Well, I'm I am kind I am kind of. This, I'm kind of cheating when I when I bring this up because I'm get, because I'm going to be using an example with um, one of one of my one of my favorite um, and one of my favorite entries that be that being the the recommended re, the recommended um, media list that's often in uh, a little game called Exalted, which happens to be one of my fa- happens to be one of my favorites, uh, which. Depending on who you ask, either either makes me a man of culture or a filthy weep. <laughs> <laughs> or you know, both is fine. Nothing wrong with either of those. So, is it like um, a list of other work that inspired me to give people a quick jolt of what they're uh, looking to expect? 
something like that. The suggest okay, I can a, do that. There's a section in there's a section in ex and I'm using Exalted Second Edition for this because I don't I don't like Third Edition. Um, but there's a but in the first chapter, there is a section called Suggested Resources, and it mentions fiction like Tales from the Flat Earth, um, Hawk Moon, the complete Pe the complete Pegana, um, when it comes um, Journey to the West. Um, it also it name drops Inuyasha, RG Veda, Ninja Scroll, Kung Fu Hustle, um, Jade Empire, um, the Thief Trilogy, and um, Dynasty Warriors. Yeah. Oh, I love Dynasty Warriors. So that's kind. That's kind of what I mean when I when I'm talking about an appendix and just. Yeah, those. sure. I can do. I can do some influences. All right. So uh, I guess the biggest one probably is I grew up playing Legend of Zelda. Mm hmm. Since I, it was my first video game ever when I was four on the original NES. And like a lot of people who grew up with the NES at four in my generation, that sticks with you. Um, so from a, an adventure standpoint, yeah, I absolutely love Legend of Zelda. And from a dungeon design standpoint, it's one of my biggest strengths. So when I, when I make dungeons uh, or extra places that you will be able to find little blurbs in the book because I don't want to go and make complete dungeons or an adventure in this campaign setting. I might do that in a later book. But for the little mini dungeons, I really like to take inspiration from Zelda. But I do have a couple of others um, if, you, if you want me to talk about those for a bit. Um, quick note, I do have to, I do have to ask... Um, if I showed, if I sh would you get triggered if I showed you a if I showed you the map of Death Mountain in Zelda Two? <laughs> no, no, Zelda Two to me is like a fine. I will beat you eventually. Stop asking challenge. Yeah, I'd, <laughs> but I'd, I'm definitely the guy who crouches in the the bottom left corner during the last fight and stabs repeatedly. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the guy who tries to take that on. I mean, give me infinite lives, sure, I'll 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 take them on. But but if I only have two or three lives. I'm 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 standing in the corner and I'm crouching yeah. and I'm stabbing. Yeah, I just use Death Mountain as a as a as a um pr as a case as a case in point when it comes to a concept I call handbreaking. What's um, that? Handbreaking is the polar opposite of handholding. Um, TV tropes also calls it guy damn it. It is basically where the solution to a given obstacle is far too obtuse to come to come to it naturally oh uh, that's just not great design man you you've gotta you gotta keep fun being paramount and if you're gonna guide somebody you at least have to give them something you can't just i i don't know i can't speak for everybody and i don't want to bash anybody else's design but at least from my design standpoint if you're designing something where the only solution is some contrived thing that is made up in 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 the the creator's mind and you're not willing to move things around a little bit to kind of uh, give your players a bone if they come up with something interesting or clever. I don't know. Like, puzzles. This, this is why I don't do classic puzzles or riddles, for an example. Because if you only have one answer, and you're sitting there as a DM, and you're you're waiting for your players to give that one answer and, and they're not doing it and they're banging their heads against a wall and it's, it's going on 20 minutes or more and they're getting frustrated. If they give me a clever answer, I'm, I'm totally the type of DM that's like, yeah, that was it. <laughs> it was that the whole time. Moving on. Yeah. Um, this is the reason why King's Quest has been my whipping boy for years. I love King's Quest. I love King's Quest, but, um, it, but, it, has, but it has old habits. Mm -hmm. Um, I just, I just want I just wanted to make that joke because everybody makes the water temple joke, but that's too easy. Yeah, well, they've apologized for that profusely. Mm -hmm. Nintendo has, so you know they know when they mess up. Yeah. But I mean, King King's Quest. Uh, speaking of, that's a great that's a great segue. Dark Souls. Oh yeah, oh. <laughs> a absolutely huge reference for me. Uh, I don't do it a hundred percent in my design because I feel like. Um, too much grimdark is not really what I'm going for. One of the things I did in the last interview that was really interesting was uh, they asked me about um, punk. And I was like, Hope Punk. Hope Punk seems uh, a pretty good uh, example of what I'm looking for. I wasn't familiar with it, but I prefer my grimdark to have a light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm all for kick-ass monsters who will mess you up. A lot of the monsters that I have included in the lower layer of Dratelia in Marta Kill 
are designed specifically like Dark Souls bosses. They are designed to mess with you. They will kick your ass. And for the players who like that, they can go down there and get their ass kicked all they want. But for the players who like regular, high fantasy, lots of magic, and uh, you know maybe not so much stakes where everything can kill you, uh, you know the surface is a, a pretty good place for you to go. Mm-hmm. But I love Dark Souls and Dark Souls bosses because I like the idea of getting my ass handed to me and having excruciating circumstances where after beating my head against the wall a thousand times, I eventually emerge triumphant. Yep. And it's it is an, it is interesting you you bring up you bring up the Souls games, um, especially especially given especially given um, on this channel in the on in the past we ended up. Having a bit of a discussion on how try, trying to adapt Dark Souls into t, into TTRPG form is not as easy as some people think. Good um, luck. No way. You got to really understand the subsystems. No way. Too hard. Yeah, i i had i had I had made the case, and I may I may end up designing it down the road that um, Sword World might might actually be able to make it work. Um, the the attempt. It was an admirable attempt from Steamforge to do it, but they ended up making problems for themselves with how they designed things. Um, chief among them was mixing mixing health and stamina into position, but still ha- but still having maneuvers take position. Were they trying to mimic poise? I guess. <laughs> I mean... If you if you really wanted to if you really wanted to mimic poise. You could you could have ta- you could have taken some notes from the o- from the old weapon speed charts way way back in AD and D if you re- if you wanted to do that. That's way before my time, and I'm not familiar with the system, but I'm all for anything that lets me go giant dad and tank everything. Yeah, and but the but the big the big the big reason why it was go- why it was going to be screwed was using classes. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have to fill me in on that. I I don't know anything about the system, but I am interested in anything that tries to make Dark Souls into TTRPGs. Well, Steamforge tried to, tried to do Dark Souls in Five E, and oh, okay. Bi- well, that's yeah. I can I can I can speak to that, and I wouldn't try it. But the big pro- the big problem with doing that is you, is since you're doing Five E, you can't unless you're unless you're really re- really um creative about it. You ha- you end up having to do classes, and Souls is n- Souls operates on a on a classless system. Right. I mean, some people argue you pick a class at character creation. You pick a starting package. You don't pick a class. Oh yeah, it's not a class. I mean, I can I can pick like you know their their de facto version of cleric, and then I'm a spellcaster by the time I'm level seven. Yeah. And that's something that's not easy to do in in a in a cl- in a class based system in a class based system or um, just showing up at level 1 with nothing mm-hmm. <laughs> which is usually the way i go about doing it uh, and over the over the last few months i've been i've been looking at fan at a fan translation of sword world 2.5 um which is sword, sword world is probably the biggest homegrown um ttrpg out of japan Mm-hmm. Um, the reason the reason why I I had pitched the idea of using that is it tech it has a it has classes but not technically. What it has instead is a is these packages that you level up and because of how it's designed, you're almost a, it's almost an expectation you're going to multi class. Oh, the result. For example, if you if you wanted to become a if you wanted to become a caster, well, take one of the well, um, spend spend like a hundred or so XP, get one get one of the casting classes, and you've got the first level you've got the first level spells accessible to you. You still need. Are a there any are there any parallels to Gestalt in this at all? I'm not familiar with what you mean by Gestalt. Oh, basically, like it's, it's modular, so you can essentially just. As as you go, just pick what you want and kind of piecemeal everything into uh, something that's like a, an amalgamation of whatever you view your character as. Yeah. So so for example, I don't know in five e, 
and everybody everybody's table is different so some people have players who they play they start out playing a fighter and then they're like I, i'm not really digging this can i change my stuff and for some tables that's that's a deal breaker so they're like no you're you know if you want kill them off roll up a new character uh, and some tables, like me, uh, it, when I'm GMing, I'm like, hey, wh whatever you want to do, I don't care. But with that, the system, a as you're describing it, it seems like it would be very conducive to just kind of picking things as you go. Like, all right, I did some fighter, but and I did want some fighter because I, I started out, say, for example, wanted to be some fighter. fiery and shot people mm -hmm. <laughs> and so with that that's that's kind of more or less what i think dark souls and that system would do well in is that that piecemeal thing because i don't always start out in a souls game when i'm i'm figuring out what i want i'm not picking my beginner character with long-term stuff in mind i'm picking it based kind of off of what i think i want to do and then i don't know i get some crazy blood sword middle of the way through and it needs some other stat that I don't have and then I respec and then I start using my kick-ass blood sword and now I'm nothing like what I was for the last 40 hours of the game so it's kind of like that which is something I like about souls yeah now with with that and with getting getting back to the matter at hand getting back to the um, big the bigger matter at hand um, with the it is also interesting you bring up Hope Punk. Not to, not to toot my own horn on anything, but I um, a while back on this channel I did an, I did an interesting little experiment with with Cyberpunk that got a few people really mad at me. Okay. Because <laughs> one thing one thing that I've been very critical of is how is how people view fantasy. All right. I.e. that there's this. There's this idea that in order for something to be fantasy, it has to be doing a past a pastiche of elements from from Tol from Tolkien and a lot of very um, Western European fa um, approaches. And I know, and I and I know this is not a new issue because I remember going on forums when I was a kid regarding um, Planescape. And seeing people argue that it was too weird to be fantasy and that it should be classified as science fiction. It is only too weird to be fantasy if your fantasy, if your idea of fantasy is that limited. Agreed. Completely agreed. And fantasy can be what anybody wants it to be. It's not necessarily science fiction just because it includes technology or future tech or, I don't know, is set in the year 3000. I mean, we're only limited by our imagination. If you want to set something in the year 3200 and and explain to your players that in your world there are things that science still can't explain that are outside of the realm of human comprehension and we call it magic, I don't, I don't know, I'm probably butchering the quote, but isn't there a quote that says something like science is only... Things you're that we don't understand. Of, magic is only science that we don't understand. You're thinking of Clark's law, um, sure. which is any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. There you go. That's but it. that's only the first half of it. Nobody ever talks about the second half. That is, any sufficiently researched magic is indistinguishable from technology. I can see how they they both work, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. But the experiment was. Is it possible to create a cyberpunk setting that isn't a dystopia? And a bunch of people got on me saying that I was trying to create a, some a utopian a utopian cyberpunk, and that was never, and I never said I was. <laughs> All right. So I, my understanding of punk, as it is described to me, is that something is punk as long as there is a major story or narrative element that goes against the status quo in some way. Mm -hmm. And so if you are going to say that cyberpunk has to be a dystopia, then I think what you're doing is pigeonholing yourself into a very specific subset of narrative concepts that stop you from telling the story that you necessarily want to tell. Yeah. So I I would say no. I would say if you if you if you want a general idea of cyberpunk, most of the time you're probably going to get dystopia. 
But I would definitely suggest that anybody looking to make something in cyberpunk, especially if you want to try to make yourself stand out in some way, is don't necessarily shoehorn yourself into that. Maybe your version of cyberpunk isn't a dystopia. Maybe the, your status quo is something that nobody has ever seen before, or at least, you know, within the bounds of originality because nothing's original. But if you want to take a different approach to it, why would you let genre purists stop you? You're, ne you're never going to get something as, as close as you can to new or exciting or something that really gets people interested in your, your, your world if you're just doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. Um, the, what, you're what you're touching on is something that we, that we in the temple call designed by gospel. The, this idea of we do things a certain way because we've always done things a certain way. And one thing that I've been telling people lately is if, if you want to see where, if you want to see the end point of that, look at the look at the racing video game scene, especially sim racers right right now where it, where it is like a decade behind everything else. So we're not talking things like burnout. Just we're no. talking things more like Gran Turismo. Gran Turismo, especially, um, especially, especially seven. Um, Assetto Corsa, Automobilista, and R Factor Two. And this this issue this issue has been exacerbated because of the the lack of the lack of um of high production arcade racers. I mean, we ha we haven't had. It, we haven't had a new Ridge Racer in almost 20 years. Uh, well, we need a new console to come out for that. <laughs> <laughs> We've had several new consoles for, for that. They always come out at launch. Every time there's a new console now, there's a new Ridge Racer game, usually. I'm that surprised we didn't get one for the... Did we get one for PS5? I'm assuming we didn't. We didn't. We didn't get one, and we didn't get one for PS4 either. They're slackers. Slackers, get on it. It's a new console. Give us a new Ridge Racer. Yeah, we haven't had that. We haven't had Midnight Club. We ha we haven't had Project Gotham. Um, oh, I love Midnight Club. Midnight Club was my favorite. Se um, even though Sega had had stuff like Sega Rally and G and GT, they seem to be focused more on kart racers these days. Yeah. Um, Capcom had Capcom had their cell shaded experiment back in the day, and they're not coming back. And so, <laughs> Miyamoto, go ahead. And Miyamoto claims that he doesn't have any new ideas for F Zero, which I find to be ridiculous. That no, that no, we've gone way too long without an F Zero. Mm -hmm. But to get on the idea that I think you were touching at is, I I go a little overboard with my design here for a couple of reasons. I know that when I'm designing a game and a, and a book like Dratelia, uh, that I, in some ways, am kind of a slave to TTRPG tropes and genre. And I know that as an author, there's nothing I'm going to be able to do to completely avoid all tropes. But on a personal note, I don't like the idea of designing by gospel. And the reason for that is because I am kind of a stickler for originality. I know I'm kind of screwed because, like I said before, nothing is original. But whenever I design something, if I see like a major IP also doing that thing, I kind of grimace a little bit. I go, uh, you know, do, do I do I really want to keep doing that now? Oh. And now that I've seen somebody else do it, I got a little bit afraid when I saw Tears of the Kingdom come out because I had spent at least a few months designing this area in the lower level of Dratelia, which is Mardikil, where all of my design pretty much went and started. And I had this idea where the underworld is sick, and it's got a bit of an illness that I call the malaise, and then out of nowhere, Tears of the Kingdom releases, and none of the uh, promotional materials told you that they were going down into the earth. They all, they all focused on the upper area and the sky islands and everything. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's like, wow, there's this whole underground area. And then there's this red stuff that really hurts you. And I was like, oh, dang. Um, now I kind of don't want to do that. But the more that I looked into it, the more I realized that they were leaning on some of those tropes. So I was like, okay, I don't have to scrap it entirely, but I don't want to be doing the same thing they are. So I really have to lean into what makes my world different than anyone else who's done an Underdark. Now, 5e has, D&D &D has an Underdark, 
uh, Galarian from Pathfinder has an Underdark. There's a, uh, a giant um, Chrono Trigger style Lavos uh, thing down there. It's like a, a giant bug. Uh, and now um, we have Zelda's, Legend of Zelda's kind of Underdark analog. Mm-hmm. So I'm never going to be able to do it 100% originally. But it really makes me drill down into the idea of I have to make absolutely certain that I'm taking this in a different direction. And I don't think that if I... I do think that if I really adhere to what makes my disability different from everybody else's life and the challenges that I have to deal with as a result of that, I'm probably not going to be stepping on anyone's toes. I'm probably going to be able to find enough narrative sauce where people look at that and they go, okay, yeah, so it is an underdark, but there's this wildly different thing that's affecting it that makes it way in left field from what anybody else is normally expecting. Mm-hmm. The, I've, I've, always, I've always argued um, to, to kind of that um, no, matter how, no matter how hard one tries, um, just, be, just because of human nature, um, tropes on some level are inescapable. Yep. Um, and try and the fur the further you, and I've seen I've seen far too often a, tra- a trap that happens with certain writers and designers where they try where they build something with the intent of not doing the tr- not doing a certain trope and end up falling into a completely different trope in the process. Yep. Uh, one could say it's a version of the predestination paradox. There's just too many. There's too many things that we've done. Too many works. Too many tropes. Too many so, works of, of art. They're never going to get away from it. So the thing that I encourage people in, instead is instead of instead of focusing on trying to make the most trying to make the most original um, pro- project possible because you're never going to do that. Focus instead on cr- on creating something that has your um, fingerprint. Your a hundred percent. And there's no way you can go wrong with that. There's no way because it's personal and it comes from you and it's going to be your take. And no matter what you do, even if you fall into every other trope, it's going to be just a slightly different, slightly adjusted version of that trope that feels like it's personal to you. And mm-hmm. the more of yourself that you can put into your work, the more of your vulnerabilities, the more of your life experiences, the more of the things that you've gone through, your fingerprint, as you were saying, which is a fantastic analogy, the more of that that you can have, the further away you're going to get from being derivative. Yeah. And like when, like I, um, I have, I have seen, I have seen my, I've seen my fair share of. I'll, I'll just use that. I'll just use SF for for an, for a example. Um, it would be very easy to. It would be very easy to write off the likes of, um, of Fading Suns, for instance, as be as being as being um as trying as trying to dip into the same to, the same toes as Dune. Okay. Um, except. There are a lot of elements that Fading Suns has that do, that Dune it, that Dune is not, and both of them are are drawing are drawing upon are drawing upon similar uh, similar elements. It's just that they do they are interpreting it in diff, in different ways. Um, especially especially since last time I checked, Dune does Dune doesn't have a uh, Dune doesn't have um have the have a, the equivalent of knightly orders. <laughs> Whereas Fading Suns does, and well, I bet, <clears throat> I bet Fading Suns doesn't have those scary ass heart plugs. Um, no, it has it has uh, it has other scary things to make up for that. Those um, scared those scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. But the original Dune movie with the guy pulling the heart plug out and then his you know he just starts bleeding out and, and and he dies. Yeah, I watched that when I was like eleven and it scared the shit out of me. But um. Of course, there's there's also in, in forms of in terms of core mechanic. Well, cr- the first attempt at doing a Dune RPG was Chronicles of the Imperium, which used the icon system that was used for the for the um, Star Trek games that Last Unicorn was putting out at the time. And Fading Suns has its victory point system, which I've nicknamed D20 Blackjack. I can get behind that because the idea, it's a roll low D20 system. You're trying you're trying to aim low. But you're trying to get as close to the line as you can. 
So if you- oh, I see what you mean. I think what's this? Brennan Mulligan said something about that recently. I think in a in a YouTube short where he was devising some kind of a system that was, I think, uh, f- far away in either direction from ten, and there was like some sort of a graded. Uh, system where the closer you got to that number, the better off you did. Is that at all in the same wheelhouse as what you're talking about? Because I'm not familiar with it. I'm just trying to figure it out as, as you're telling me. Well, I'll use that rule of 10 as, as my example. What you would want to do is try, is try and get um, try and get as close to like 9 as you could. Because the, clo- the higher up that you go, the more victory points, i.e. degrees of success you get. But if you if you get right on it, you that's that's a um, that's a botch, and if you go over it, that's a fail because you well bust. Much like why Alex. is it why is it off when you get right on it? Um, that's that's that is how that is how it's set up. Where if you get if you get the if you get right on it, that is a critical failure. But if you go if you go over it, you, then you bust. It's basic. Getting right on it is basically the equivalent of a natural one. Oh. Because I, w- I heard blackjack and I was like, okay, well, if I get a twenty-one, blackjack's the clo- the closest analog I-, I could use. I mean, when I was co- when I was covering uh, weapons of the gods, I referred to that as a D- as a Yahtzee like D10 pool because it's not about um, getting a bu- getting a bunch of hits like in say World of Darkness. It is you're trying to you're trying to roll high sets because mm-hmm. the num the number of die that the number of matching die that roll is the tens digit that you rolled. And the facing of it is the ones, and I immediately thought of Yahtzee when I saw that. Oh, it's interesting. I I uh, I like hearing about this stuff, mm-hmm. but I, it's it's a little difficult for me to follow along because I'm really only familiar with Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. Like I I tried I tried Pathfinder a little bit, uh, way back in first edition. And I mean, I liked what I played of it, but I didn't really get as as much exposure to that system as I would have liked. Mm-hmm. And recently, since I've really been getting into uh, the creative side and the 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 authorship side of of a book, I've been looking into other systems briefly, just kind of dipping my toes in the water, especially with the OGL situation that really made everything really tenuous for a while. I was like, okay, maybe I should look into some other systems, and I, I looked at fate and briefly and i looked at maybe going into pathfinder because that was a really tough time for creatives you know we weren't sure whether our whole stuff was gonna you know all fall flat and not be able to make anything and as a first time creator i was like oh oh shit you know what do i do now so i did look into some other systems but like your knowledge of this stuff is really on point so I feel like I'm I'm following along, but I'm learning stuff as I go, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. And I like I like cherry picking stuff as a, as a GM. So if I if I hear something that's cool, like the idea of this blackjack thing, where I'm like, okay, well, let's roll and try to get as close to something as possible, I might homebrew that in one of my games mm-hmm. if it's a really good mechanic. But I would still try to stick with five E for the most part because you know that's what I know. Yeah. Oh. Uh- uh, with 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 that in mind, there there were four races that that were put in in the um, in the ki- in the Kickstarter, and one one of them went in detail in, in the preview. That being the Aflorum, yep. the Aflorum. Yep. Um, what can you tell me about the other three, starting with the um, Strasker? Okay, yeah. So I uh, everything you you want to know about the Aflorum pretty much is in the preview packet. Mm-hmm. I. Uh, that's absolutely free if anybody wants to go to the Kickstarter there's a link to the website the website gives you the free preview packet and I include everything you need to know about them in there including their culture uh, which is something that I I saw a lot of people asking for Mm -hmm. in their books they're like okay well thanks for giving me that blurb on your race but there's no culture stuff so if you want the Aflorum's culture it's all in there Mm -hmm. but let's move on like you said to the things that you don't see the Strasker are a group of tornado-tailed wind elemental squirrel birds. And when I create a race, one of the things I like to do, and this stems from my background in Monster Hunter, which is another fantastic game series that I absolutely Mm -hmm. adore, is I like to go beyond just take one creature and uh, give it a power and 
call it a day. I like to take two or three or more creatures and then give it an interesting quirk and then give it some sort of power and mix them all together in some sort of weird chimera and see what comes out of that. And it's usually a pretty interesting challenge for the artists that I'm hiring for the book. Uh, But these guys are a mix of squirrel and bird. Mm-hmm. And and you can't really see it too much from the artwork there, but their feet are, they look kind of like chickens. And their whole deal is they like to use their tails to give themselves a massive burst of air that creates a pillar. And that pillar of air is good for friendlies. So, for example, if you're the type of person who sees a, if it's a player rather, not really a person, if you're the type of player who at low level you don't like the idea of uh, using your tools and you just want to get up a cliff and you want all your friends to get up a cliff because you're not the type of player who wants to stand up there goading them and be like hey I got up here but you know all you guys are screwed then you can use your little tornado tails and poof you go up and they can follow you and why this was interesting to me is I thought uh, my play, one of my players uh, came up with this idea, uh, and they. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna tell a cute story of how this this started. This this stems from a, a, an actual thing that happened in game. One of my players makes a tornado. Casts a spell. There's a tornado going on in the middle of the the room. Another one of my players, the druid, turns into a, a, a mammoth, and they go into the tornado. And I narrate this as now a giant mammoth who is spinning (laughs) at the top of a tornado, trumpeting sounds that are reverberating in circles around the room. And another one of them goes in the tornado and rolls a critical failure, and it throws them into the roof at high speed. So I thought, why not make a 30-foot pillar that your friends can use to jump large distances and and deal with problems but at the same time you can use it on enemies to make them slap into the ceiling Mm -hmm. and that narrative concept gave gave everybody a good chuckle yeah uh little little things about their culture uh well they are kind of a weird collectivism society in more ways than one because i liked the idea of having them all work together as collectivists, but also use the word collectivism uh, kind of a tongue-in-cheek because they like to collect nuts. So so I went with that route. And the funniest thing about them is they don't have a set ruler. All their societies are based off of the idea of whoever collects the largest nut is currently the monarch. And that is constantly in jeopardy. So, like, say I'm a Strasker, and I'm like, hey, I want to be king for a day. So I go get a big nut that's bigger than the biggest nut that my the current monarch has, and now I sit on it, and now I'm King Strasker. <laughs> Until somebody else goes and gets a bigger nut than me, and then they're king. It, um, <clears throat> you know, there, there's a joke I could there's a joke I could have made, but nah, but nah, too easy. Do it, do it, do it. I want to um, hear it. Fine. It's only a matter. It's only a ma- It's only a matter of time before before somebody declares their character, um, King D's. Yep, D's nuts. Yep, knew it. <laughs> I goaded you into it, which is you know poetic considering D's nuts. Yeah. Um, but hey, I mean, I'm all for that. We we have we have a good time in our our games. I like to think I'm I'm not one of the the types of GMs who has a table where we're all serious. Everybody is telling jokes at the table. These nuts is a regular occurrence. Uh, not necessarily. I haven't had anybody uh, placed with the Strasker yet because uh, I was developing this alongside the world. So the world kind of came first, and then the the book got made and more or less and then if I go back into the world my players are going to get to pick up on some of these races that they help develop but I I definitely foresee tons of D's nuts jokes yeah that's 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 my player base right there uh, and ne- next on the list would be the um Emery the Amiri the yes Amiri. the Amiri are your my kind of fork from the classic warrior race because there's a lot of tropes, like we said about tropes earlier, there's a lot of tropes you can run into with warrior race. 
Uh, and I wanted to try to go off in a little bit of a different direction. So they're based loosely off of the Atlas Moth. And my artist who came up with the design for them really wanted to go with a moth insect snake hybrid. And so I was, I was all for that because I like to add additional layers. So they're part snake, part moth, but they don't have wings because I didn't want them to fly. And we came up with this idea that since they're a warrior society, they're very, very much into the idea of status. So instead of wings, they wear flags on their backs that are wing-like, which indicate what level of status they have in their society. But like the Atlas Moth, who has this kind of snake-like pattern on their wings, which is where we settled in the design when we were going to mix snake and moth together, we like, okay, well, the Atlas Moth has, has these snakes as their patterns on the, the back of their wings. So the Atlas Moth, the females of the, the species are bigger than the males. So all of the women are the fighters and the men are more of the working class in that society but I didn't want to go with the whole the, uh, planet of hats mm -hmm. so because a race isn't a monolith not, not one member of a race is going to be the same as anyone else so I had to really work with their culture and their society to make sure that okay so the majority of the the, the females of the species do end up going into uh, combat scenarios but that doesn't preclude the males from doing so and it doesn't preclude the females from being locked into that so in other aspects of their society you get a lot of people making their own choices and decisions but they're they all pretty much have this idea of status looming over them they want to improve their status they want to they want to make sure that they're wearing these more decorative more ornate flags and raising themselves up in their community and to do that that's mostly done through combat. It's mostly done through fighting. So we've got places in the world where they can go, where there's endless fighting going on. Uh, I've got this one city uh, that is a constant vying for attention with the bloom fonts, which are a massive 80-foot-tall resource of magical energy. And one of the bloom fonts is not controlled by anybody. It's in a constant state of war between the Emiri and the Dragonborn. And they all have this kind of gentleman's agreement where they're all they're all fighting all the time to figure out who's best. It's not really fighting for like because they hate each other because I don't really like writing that too much in fiction but they're fighting more of kind of like who's the best you know who's who's out on top and they've been going for like a few hundred years now yeah and I could I could make I could make joke about I could make jokes about sp about sports rivalries but I'll simply say back in the back in the day the the um, NFC North was known as the Black and Blue Division for a reason. <laughs> I have to, I'll have to stick my brother on that. He's he's more of the sports guy. I, I am I am so I am a I seem I seem to be an outlier in 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 the sense of being somebody who is it is able to hold his. Oh own no 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 no! That <laughs> that's totally fine. There's a there's a wealth of people in this hobby. There's a ton of people. They don't all have to be weird uh, introverts and uh, nerds like myself. Yeah. There's a lot of people who like uh, I don't know. You probably wouldn't say that to Vin Diesel, uh, <laughs> right? No, I, no, I'd say no, I'd say uh, I'd say other things to Vin Diesel. Like why do you why do you suck these days? <laughs> well, I'm not gonna go into it. I I don't know if I'd tell that to his face. He, I, I hear he's a good guy, though. I hear he's got a heart of gold. Oh, it, yeah. I ju it's just he's in, just big. In the, I hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. <laughs> yeah, we are. Oh. In other words, no, that's, that's, that's that's really good, though. That's good that you 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 have other hobbies outside the uh, the normal wheelhouse of of uh, of this stuff. My my brother likes tabletop stuff, and yeah. he's a huge sports guy. Yeah. I uh, I will admit that when when I do I do delve into sports I'm mo I am mostly a shit poster because every sport has that has that one has that one team or individual that is my whipping boy. Um, mm -hmm. In in football it is the Cowboys. In um, Formula One it's Ferrari. <laughs> in 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 hockey it's the it's the Maple Leafs. Um, 
Okay, so um, if I were a sports guy, I would say we have beef because I live in Texas and I'm Canadian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, I'm not a sports guy, so we don't have beef. Well, for in a lot of the in a lot of the cases with the, with those particular whipping boys, the reason is the same. Um, a either a team or a fan base that talks a whole lot of shit but hasn't done anything in years. I agree with that. As a Canadian, we do talk a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. um, Leafs. When it comes to the Leafs, they every year. Every year, I have to hear this is going to be the year, and every year it doesn't happen. And that's been nope. that's been the case for over fifty years. Um, in <laughs> I have to hear the exact same thing with with Cowboys with Cowboys fans, and ev and it, the last few years especially, they seem to find new and interesting ways to get in their own damn way. Well, I mean. I would be remiss if I did not. My brother would would, would kill me if I did not mention the uh, n is it nineteen nineties nineteen nineties cowboy dynasty. Yeah, I would counter with like what have you done for me lately? <laughs> right, the Troy Aikman era. Yeah, I mean that that kind of that dynasty is nice, but to, but but again, but it's a case of what have you what have you done for me lately? And uh, anyway, my brother was always a a, a San Fran fan, so. Well, he's, that's yeah. because he has taste. <laughs> I'll be sure to tell him. <laughs> yeah, but um, with the with the with the Avasa, um, just from just from the design of them, I keep getting a vibe of um, geckos. Kind of, kind of geckos. Okay, so there's there, I could talk about the Avasa forever. They are my probably my most well. Uh, the design I keep close to the chest. Mm -hmm. So the Avasa are um, indigenous to Mardikil, which is the name of the lower layer of Jutelia. That's where everything's sick. Mm -hmm. The Avasa, they grew up there. They are the closest to kind of like me, or an analog to me, and, and the, the stuff that I have to deal with as a result of uh, how this whole world developed in my condition. So they are down there, and they are accustomed to suffering. Everything that lives in Mardikil, in that lower layer of sickness, has to deal with the, the illness of the planet and the dysfunction that it causes. So down there, y your body is constantly undergoing pain. You have this near constant pressure, ex like a downward force exerting on you all the time that makes you feel like you can't keep going, you can't move on. And they, they grew up there. They lived there. That is their life to them. And for a lot of people, especially people who are born with chronic conditions, they don't know what it's like in real life to grow up uh, without that lifestyle. And me, I, I was fortunate enough to have at least the majority of my childhood and my d adult life before this uh, condition started affecting me. I've only, I'm 38 now, I've been dealing with it for the greater part of about five years. But the Avasa were born with it. They were born in, in this kind of shit show of a circumstance and as a result their entire culture even their art forms and how they express themselves is based off of the overcoming of this obstacle because for me and this goes back to hope punk the whole thing is it's, it's based on myself i have to personally drew find a way to keep putting my 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 feet in front of each other as i go one foot in front of the other keep making progress even if it's just a little bit every day and they the avasa are indicative of that they've learned to express themselves through this but there's also a surface level so eventually i figured okay you know i can't have them down there forever eventually they're going to find their way to the surface so now they have this kind of buddy system where the ones on the surface who have a completely different culture it's very culture shock for an Avasa to come out of Mardikil because now you're on the surface there's no more crushing fatigue there's no more pain, there's no more constantly being hunted by the behemoths who live down there who will rip you to shreds if they see you and they're just like okay well here's the sun and people and kindness and camaraderie and okay here's my, here, here's my people and they have a, a settlement up here and life is different and it's a huge culture shock for them. So I decided I'm going to have to build a physiology around that idea. So what, 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 what might they look like? 
And one of my favorite uh, examples is a lot of people ask in D&D is I want to play somebody who's blind. But as I'm sure you're aware, uh, most people will tell you don't do it because a blind character is usually kind of just a, a downer to their party. It usually makes things harder. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to do the absolute best I can to facilitate that for players who want to play blind characters. And since the Avasa are roughly made around the idea of disability, let's go ahead and make that their shtick. So the Avasa have this mask over their face, mm -hmm. kind of like this carapace mask, and their eyes glow behind it. <clears throat> so they have blind sense out to about 30 feet. And, all right, okay, well, what else would have blind sense? Some sort of aquatic creature. Something that was uh, accustomed to being able to see their way around in really strong, dark, pressurized depths. So I'm like, all right, let's 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 start with an aquatic creature. All right, and I don't have anything currently representing the water element for my bloom font, so let's mer mix in a little bit of mud skipper. Let's mix in a little bit of blue slug glaucus. Uh, make it swim upside down so that it's, it's kind of weird. And then from there... I came up with the idea of clag, which is a, an, a kind of an elemental material that shows up a lot in Dratelia. It's kind of this sticky, amber-like substance, mm -hmm. and they puke it. They just throw it up. And they can throw it up so much that it becomes a breath weapon. <laughs> and they can stop people from moving by puking up enough of this kind of sticky clag am amber substance. And what really cemented it for me was this ridiculously silly idea I got. is is a little tangential, but you're you're, you're not going to get stuff like this unless you get the book. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tease this here a little bit. There's a bard, an Ivasa bard, and his name is Teoxel. And what he does is he holds concerts singing but when he sings he he spews this clag like a breath weapon and i had the idea that if have you ever seen like kind of uh, like avant-garde performances where somebody does something like wildly ridiculous and everybody just kind of claps along because they're like i'm just going along with it i don't know what this is but i'm I just it must be great because everybody else is clapping mm -hmm. he pukes on everybody in the audience and they can't get enough of it You've they made think it's you've made a fantasy version of Gallagher. <laughs> they think it's the greatest thing ever. Like all all I'm seeing all I'm hearing out of that is get is Gallagher in a fantasy setting. Yeah, I guess you can make a parallel out of that. Like it's it's just I thought that idea was hilarious and I can't go back. So once I thought of that, I was just like, okay, how else how else do we just keep pushing this envelope as far as we can go? Yeah. Now I've got one more if you want to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Th there was the last one, the um, go the Gogants. Yeah, I just I just released them as a subclass. The artist who's working on that, Clara Fang, she is absolutely phenomenal, and she just brought one of the subclasses to life. And so I threw those those guys in there as a preview, uh, the Gogants. So Gogants uh, are a play on the word Gigant. They are they believe they are bigger than they are, and they are a mix of goat and rhino and earth elemental and crystal. And so what their whole deal is is they they are the ones who built agriculture in the world. Uh, when you have a Magitek world system that's based on the idea of everybody having to get along and cooperate because there's a giant planet in the sky that looks like what's going to happen to your planet if you mess up and don't cooperate, certain creatures are going to naturally fall into different rules. And one of the things that all the cities have to do with giant 100-foot tall uh, land waves that destroy cities is they had to build Magitek to to cover their bases. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, they have to shield the city from the giant land waves. And when they shield the city, then everything ends up being kind of compartmentalized into isolationist towns. Because you don't want to be outside of the city barrier that protects you from the 100-foot walls, uh, wall of, of, of land, because then you'll just die 
or in your city will get destroyed. And once you're in there, you have a population issue. So everybody has to build tall rather than build wide to bring out a civilization reference. So all my cities are tall. So as a result, the Gogans are the ones who built agriculture, and they built this kind of vertical Magitek-induced agriculture where they've got these terraced uh, steps where they just kind of build uh, plants and food into the side of buildings, and it just goes up. And so, all right, what what happens from that? So from there, I decided they're really good at climbing. And then from that, I gave them these crystal hands, which give them the ability to climb ridiculously good, uh, ridiculously well. And then I was like, okay, who else climbs ridiculously well? So I got goat. And then I was like, okay, just to make it fun, who doesn't climb well? (laughs) Just, Just to throw a wrench into that. And then I was like, rhino. A rhino would not be very good at climbing, I don't think. So I mixed those two things together, and I was like, all right, now you have a climbing rhino, which I find hilarious. Yeah. And with now shif- shifting into um, subclasses, mm-hmm. I, I, did, I do appreciate that ev- every one of the main classes, every one of the main classes is getting, su- <laughs> is getting some degree of love with this list. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I was really going for uh, offering things that I know players want but are missing because yeah, I've I've had to deal with I've had to deal with some games that um, very their setting very clearly favors some classes over others and if if it if it makes sense if it makes sense for the setting that's that's nice and all but it doesn't it does mean it bottlenecks the kind of characters that can play in it right that's not that's not a slag on it it's just, it's just the way this kind of thing works <laughs> yep and I, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to kind of go into a little a little bit of them because because each of them each of them I feel is going to be doing something interesting. The the primal behemoth barbarian. I'm guessing since it mentions um, becoming like an elemental beast, there's gonna, this is going to be a transforming type of barbarian. Uh, yes. There's two main parts to the the subclass that. It does two things that I really wanted Barbarian to do, and <clears throat> they kind of went hand in hand with each other. Originally, I thought, all right, I have these behemoths, these massive monster hunter style monsters that just mess everything up and are absolutely terrifying, and I have to try to link that into the setting a little bit, and I didn't really see a, a great subclass based off of transformation, but at the same time, I also... I'm a barbarian player when I do get around to playing every once in a blue moon. I love barbarians. And one of my favorite archetypes of barbarians is the guy who just picks something up and hits you with it. And the thing I like picking up the most are giant rocks. So I, I read around the same time I was deciding on what to do with the subclass. I also read that people were like uh, a, a subreddit where people like, okay, what, what kind of things do you want to do as a player but aren't really being facilitated? And somebody said, I want, to, I, want, I want to be a barbarian that throws giant rocks. And I was like, yes, I also would love to be a barbarian who throws giant rocks. So when it got around to the time where I was like, I got to make a barbarian subclass, I was like, all right, I want to do this. Other people want to do this. I don't see it really happening in the game or a way to really facilitate the, the, the giant rock throwing which one of my behemoths goes around throwing giant rocks? And I was like, oh, probably the Earth Elemental ones. Mm-hmm. So I, I base the the primal behemoth barbarian around the idea of transforming parts of your body into a giant Earth Elemental beast of your choice, kind of like how Monk gets um, astral. The, the There's a Monk subclass that like, gives you astral arms. Mm-hmm. And in that subclass, it says, okay, well, you know, within that subclass, you can kind of pick what you want it to look like for flavor, because flavor's free. And I was like, I like that idea. So pick your own Earth Behemoth style creature. Or, you know, if you're not playing 5e, um, from a game design standpoint, pick whatever monster that resonates with you that kind of has that Earth element and is kind of a, a bulky monster, like a beetle or, a, you know, something big that mm-hmm. would throw rocks. And partially transform into that so that you can just pick up a lot of really big shit and heave it at things that you don't like. 
Yeah. Uh, the, I think, I might be wrong, but I think the one you're thinking of is the Way of the Astral Self, which was in Unearthed yep. Arcana, yep. and yep. devolved into a JoJo reference. <laughs> oh, I love JoJo. I mean, if I'm getting if I'm getting close to JoJo, then we're in a good place. Yeah. Uh, but with with the Col- with the College of Bellows for the Bard. That's um, based off of the Teoxel guy that I told you earlier. Yeah. So we so we can we kind of we kind of ended up um going full going circle. into its kit, going into its kit full circle. So I'll skip I will skip that since we already dipped we already dipped into I, it. I, I can give you a little taste. I All can right. give you a little taste. All right. Um I don't want to get too much into it, but basically there there's another subclass that kind of holds an ability. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember which one it is, but it's just loosely based off of that. And my one of my players um, wasn't really satisfied with Bard. They said that there's there's nothing that, about Bard or any of its subclasses that really gets into the idea of hardcore performance arts. Like like somebody who's it's it's flavor. A lot of Bards do performances as flavor, but they didn't see any really subclasses that were just like, okay, I want to put on a performance. So the idea with the College of Bellows is that. It, it's it's about resonance, whether you're putting your instrument on the ground and shaking the ground like the ground tremors uh, from the setting, or if you're just doing a deep vibrato-based resonance, you're, you're using performance as an art, and it holds an ability, a performance, for when you can use it whenever you like that grant temporary effects. Mm-hmm. That's the idea. Yeah. So... Next would be the geo domain, and since it's talking about terrain manipulation, um, I'm immediately thinking geomancers. Uh, yes, yeah, something um, a lot like that. And I, uh, we were talking about that in the pregame uh, the other day when I was, uh, you know, you introduced yourself to me, and we went off at length about geomancers and that sort of stuff. And yes, that is pretty much um, what it's going for, with some extra caveats. Mm-hmm. And a lot. Whenever I've whenever I've seen people do geomancers, whether it be in their own systems or in or in five e, um, the thing that always makes it tricky is the fact that this is essentially a terrain caster, and that does mean you have to uh, kind kind of kind of dub, kind of double or tri- or triple up the potential spells to have to have a set of effects for different terrains. Um, do you have something similar to that, or did you or did you find a way around that? I went in a different direction. What I was doing with geomancy for that is um, more of a magnetic form of, of, of geo. So when I say geo, it's more like um, the Earth's gravitational pull and and uh, like magnetospheres and whatnot. And it uses kind of Earth element, but in a way that is for um, crowd control and mostly for keeping enemies on you. Uh, one of my players mentioned that their cleric, when they were playing cleric, they really wanted to play the kind of style of cleric that was a, a an uber tank. They wanted to be the, the hero of the party that kept everybody on them at all times and just held the line. Kept the, the, the players in the back who were playing a, I believe at the time it was a ranged fighter and, and the aforementioned bard. And they wanted to be that kind of hero fantasy. They wanted to be like, nope, you're not going anywhere. And um, Sentinel and uh, the the spirit warrior um, spell that is very often cast as cleric, uh, like spirit ancestry or something like that, it wasn't really doing it for them. So I was like, all right, what if I give you a, a kind of like a magnetic ability that, that keeps people on you? And what if I allow you to do kind of mini earthquakes that suck that they're out, outside in an outside circle and go inward towards you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and they were like, yeah, sure. So we play tested that ability and it, it worked out really well. Uh, so much so that I decided to, to keep it. And I, I have uh, abilities that are like labeled things like Terra kinetic impetus, uh, which all pretty much do things that just kind of draw enemies in. Mm-hmm. And you got to be really careful with that because I think there's there's a lot of reasons why 5e doesn't really facilitate tanks. And I didn't like that. So I was like, all right, you know what? I don't I don't care that 5e is not really trying to facilitate tanks or that there's reasons why they're not doing it. I'm going to I'm going to find a way around that 
because so many fighter players want to play a tank. They want to be the the kind of player that just says, nope, you're not getting past me. I am a wall. And I, I, I do not see that in 5e. Maybe there was more in 4e. I don't remember. I skipped 4e. There was probably more from what I've read about 4e. 4e has a lot, and I'm going to get crucified over this, but 4e has a lot of stuff that I really like. I'm You're a not going to get fan. crucified in this temple about that because uh, thank, thank God. I because um, for- I have I have I I was I was a I was a very ardent defender of a lot of the stuff that 4e was do- was doing. I mm-hmm. also took people to task over the tabletop WoW accusation, especially 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 as I started to study more and more about World of Warcraft's game design, and I realized people were using that the, the same way people use. Um, Call of Duty to as if it's as if it's somehow emblematic of the entire shooter genre. Right, right, yep. And it's a case of you you can ha- you can have your own you you can have your own opinion and the like, but um, but your but your own opinion doesn't mean it's above reproach. And yeah, people I, are gonna. I I can tell people are gonna already say in the comments uh, every every day. There's somebody who gets closer to reinventing 4E in fifth edition. So you're absolutely right. I can hear and it already. If um, if 4E was such if 4E was such a disaster, then the question that I keep asking is, why is it that I keep seeing so many so many people trying to trying to bring in the warlord from from 4E into 5E? And and every other piece of it. See, there is absolutely as a as a game designer, and really this is what we do when we create books like these: is you have to be good at game design. Recognize what works. You don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because you don't like 4E maybe as a system and and the whole thing doesn't work for you as a cohesive uh, whole doesn't mean you can't find elements or aspects of it that work and just be like, okay, yes, this works. I like this. And maybe a lot of other people do too. And what's wrong with bringing something like that into the game if it's going to provide enjoyment for a subset of people who are clamoring for it? There's a reason why people like this sort of stuff. And if I can facilitate that in my book, all the better. Yeah, and apparent apparently you weren't the only you weren't the only one who was, who was thinking of of draw, of drawing from 4E in some form because that's how we got 13th age. Yes, and also um, the Tome of Battle Book of Nine Swords, otherwise known as the uh, Book of Weeaboo Fighting Magic. Yeah, which um, I got I got myself in trouble for 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 what I had said on that front because. Um, a bunch of people were doing that. Were doing this whole thing of of that it was somehow wrong to be taking inspiration from video games, and I I had given a warning, and because of my warnings, I I seem to be my some of my friend some of my friends have co- have made Nostradamus jokes about me because of this. I had said you are going to be dealing with a whole generation who did not get their start with Tolkien, did not get their start with Moorcock, did not get their start with Lieber. Or or um or Howard etc. They they are go- their introduction to fantasy is going to be through is going to be through video games. It's going to be through anime and, and manga. It's going to be through um, comics. And some of the people who get into fantasy through that are inevitably be- going to become game designers. Yep, and- that is exactly the boat that I'm in. But it does not preclude the fact that understanding good game design is still paramount. Yeah. Um, I was I was mostly referring to the I was mostly referring to the fact that a lot of the things that are supposed traditions in something like D and D are just things that Gygax and Arneson happen to be happen to be fans of growing up. Burn your sacred cows, people. Uh, although don't although don't burn them for their own sake. <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay. So there's a difference between just saying I like this thing, I'd like to include it in my game, which is nothing wrong, mm-hmm. and then there's another thing entirely by saying there is a hole in design space that is not being facilitated and some other thing does that correctly and will facilitate that for other people and if you don't find a way to incorporate that in your design you're just going to have to leave it out and i don't if i see something that i want to do that i know is going to resonate with people i'm not going to leave that out just because it's a challenge to find a way to put it into the design space that I'm trying to do. I'm going to find a way to put it into that design space. If I like it, it's the style of play that I want, and it's the style of play I know other people want. And that's a perfect example here. Mm-hmm. So, 
yeah, you, you are going to have a legion of people who are game designers who cut their teeth on classic video games and want to incorporate that into uh, TTRP game design. I think there needs to be more of that because I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from game design and from video games that are ubiquitous in this industry. I'll give you one example, and I don't want to go too much into it, but it's an example that's very dear to my heart, so I will include it. Um, dungeon design can learn from platformers. I can, I can, de I can definitely see that. and I'll, I'll explain why. In platform game design, specifically Super Mario Brothers, which is something that I am uh, about as educated in as I could say I'm educated in something. I don't like to say I'm educated in something, but I actually kind of put a little bit of time into studying, so I know a few things about it. I'm not a complete dunce when it comes to understanding platformers. There's a, a thing called expanding and evolving mechanics in, in Super Mario Brothers, and basically what it means in a nutshell is you have an obstacle, and then you introduce your player to that obstacle, and it's pretty safe, and then afterwards you change the obstacle in some way, and it's a little bit different, and then you expand it, so now there's two obstacles, and then you evolve that one, and so there's like obstacle number 2.5, and then you continue iterating on that as you go, and eventually you've got six, seven, eight des differently designed obstacles of the same theme in that level and that's what makes a, a platforming level memorable and exciting because you can learn from that obstacle and you can you, you grow with it and then you master it as a player you can take that idea and and put that into a dungeon mechanic in a tabletop rpg by designing your dungeon around a similar mechanic or theme instead of just saying okay well i'm going to put a fire trap here and i'm going to put some fire goblins and i'm going to make six rooms and i'm going to call it a day no you design a fire trap mechanic, and then you iterate on that fire trap mechanic. And the second time the players see that, they go, oh, I've seen this before. I know what to do. And then the third time they see it, it's, it's even more complex. And they kind of know what to do, but it's more evolved now. And it's a, it, they, they've got the, the, an inkling of how to solve it because they solved the previous one. But now it's got an additional challenge on top of that. Or now they walk into the fourth room, and there's an evolved fire trap and a bunch of fire goblins trying to attack them at the same time they're trying to figure out what makes this new challenge different. That, I think, is what makes a memorable dungeon. That's video game design. You're never going to see that in most TTRPGs. But if you're a game designer and you look to other sources like World of Warcraft, like you mentioned, or platforming games, or trying to take what works in game design, not just video game design, but game design, because a TTRPG is a game, you'll open up all kinds of opportunities for, for making things interesting and exciting for players. Yeah, and I will I will admit I have used um, I've used I've used certain shooters to to help um to help re to help refine how I hand how I handle encounter design. Um. So you do this too. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I I um to you to use an to use a to use an example of what I of what I mean when it comes to this. Um, have how familiar are you with Doom? <laughs> Rip and tear. Yeah. So let's 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 look at let's look at Doom two. Let's look at Doom two because I played way I played way too much of the, of that in particular and wait and way too much of um. Well, my introduction was Final Doom, so I so I had so I was able to see the best and pro and. I won't say the worst, but definitely the most boring of expansions. That the best being the Plutonia experiment, even though it will kick your ass, and the worst and the boring being TNT. Oh. In fact, I'd say TNT is a good example of why bigger is better is not always the case. Mm -hmm. But you look at the, you look at the monster design in that, and each each one has each one has a role that. That um you that you have to adapt to, um, you have you obviously have your you have you obviously have your low tier fodder in in terms of shotgunners, but then you have um chain gunners who are hit scan, so they're gonna take priority. Then you've got pinkies who are gonna try and get right in your damn face, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you and you have to learn the pinky dance very very quickly. Um, you've got the, you've got the annoying motherfuckers in forms of in the form of lost souls who will. Who will just bum rush you the second they see you, 
you have you have the you have bigger stuff like Ma like Mancubus and and Sp and spider demons yep. um, who who are who are more are more bullet sp are more bullet spongy but do, but can but can but can still be an issue if you don't if you're not careful um mm -hmm. there's the there's the good old cacos who are all rounders and tend to get overused and then I love, I love caca demons and um then and then there's the then there's the archvile which is the drop everything and take him out fast mm -hmm. <laughs> Because if you don't, he will he will find new and interesting ways to wreck you, either either through setting you on fire or reviving guys you already killed. The point the point is is that each each of them each of them has is a little bit of a puzzle piece in in that bigger puzzle. But mm -hmm. it is funny you bring up Mario because there there is a there is a um there's a term that I that I that you end up seeing a lot when you look at storytelling in in part in parts of East Asia that. Miyamoto outright admitted what he used in level design for a lot of the Mario games, and that it now it's it's had a bunch of names, but the one that I'm the most familiar with is, is his Japanese version, Ki Sho Ten Cats. Never heard of it. What is it? It is a structure that's akin to much like how there's the three act play structure. Everybody knows this is a four act structure. Um, it is introduction, development. Twist conclusion. Yep. And it's been it's been used to do it's been used to do storytelling. It's been used to do photocopying, and it's been used to do level design. If it works. And it's I suppose the I suppose the most popular way it, way it gets used when it when it comes to weebs is the four coma um, format with manga, which is meant to be a story in four panels. I am. I. I think I've heard that term before. I don't know enough about it, but I'm pretty sure I've heard that term before. Yeah. Yeah. The it's it is a it is essentially it is akin to a comic strip. It's just that it's always uses four panels and only four panels. And that and because of that, this the Kisho Ten Cat structure gets used a lot in it. Mm -hmm. But. Shifting into the Overbloom Druid, um, yes, I get, I get the feeling that's one that's going to be delving that leans more into wild shaping than it does in um, casting. Yeah, it's um, so Druid already has a ton of subclasses that are trying to make it uh, um, more of a, a, a caster, and I'm honestly I'm surprised that there isn't a dedicated nature style spell casting druid but I didn't want to go that route because I figured that's I mean it's pretty obvious and if I do it eventually somebody else is going to do it too and I, I don't want to you know make something that isn't at least trying to be somewhat original uh, so this one is uh, just replacing the existing wild shape with a another stat block and I kind of I tripped into a little bit of one D D with this because I, I did it before any of the one D and D stuff decided to mess with the stat blocks, but I was like, all right, I just all, all I want to do with this druid is make some kind of wild shape ability that represents some aspects of my setting that give druid players something else to wild shape into that isn't Circle of the Moon. Mm -hmm. So Circle of the Moon is great, but sometimes you just want a dedicated form. And I know Circle of the Moon has elementals, and to me, that doesn't really fit Circle of the Moon, because you have, okay, let's transform into a bunch of different creatures, and then let's get better at transforming into those creatures, and then let's have more creature-based abilities, and okay, yeah, at level 10, you can just randomly turn into some friggin' elemental, and that's just out of left field. And I was like, okay, well, where's the class that all of its abilities are like that? You know, why just kind of shoehorn elementals into Circle of the Moon where it doesn't really have, as far as I can tell, any narrative business being? I mean, from one to nine as a cir Circle of the Moon druid, you're picking out monster forms and you're becoming a giant scorpion and a dire wolf and a, I don't know, a, a attack hamster. Like, wh where the hell does elementals come into this? So it's like, all right, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to bore down to the, the base of what that was supposed to try to do and and build that back up 
into something different. So I was like, all right, let's 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 make it a plant kind of nature elemental hybrid because what the overbloom is is the overbloom is kind of my representation of ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you got your eight, 80 foot tall bloom fonts that expel virescence, my magical energy, into the world. And they're all over the place. And wherever you see a bloom font, it's expelling magical energy. And it's real easy to develop a, a city around these bloom fonts. But when the land shifts and you get those giant land waves, the, the, the bloom fonts, they, they get a little bit messed up. So the easiest way for me to explain this, this whole phenomenon, and this is crucial to the entire setting, is I am I am bedridden the majority of the time because of chronic fatigue syndrome. I don't really get to get up a lot. When I overexert myself, like if I do too much exercise, or sometimes that could be as easy as getting up and taking a shower. That might be too much exercise, or you know, um, getting too stressed out, or getting up and walking too much. I will basically pass out essentially I will get this massive crushing fatigue and I can't go anywhere or do anything mm -hmm. so I have to be in bed 95 something 90% of the time but the problem is I I'm, I have a creative brain and I like to make stuff and I also have ADHD which I've had my whole life so you can imagine sitting around and doing nothing 95% of my day is not easy so I have to have this balancing act where if I do too much, I get fatigue. If I do too little and I'm sitting around doing nothing, my brain just kind of goes into overdrive mode and I start getting a little fidgety and whatnot. So the bloom fonts are a representation of that. If in Drutelia you cast too much magic or too much magic gets used in an area or people are getting too developmental too quickly or too much progress too quickly as a result of magic then the, the, the magic ley lines of the world become like me they become thick and sluggish and well I don't, I'm, I'm not thick I'm 150 pounds but you get the idea it becomes thicker and harder to move and sluggish and, and difficult but if you don't use magic the opposite happens. They trigger kind of like my ADHD stuff, and they overload, and then poof, like a volcano. So the druid, Circle of the Overbloom, is that. It is a plant, nature, element, hybrid being that you're like transforming into that is the equivalent of uh, too much energy being ex 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 like happening all at once. Mm-hmm. So, the next one I want I wanted to ask is the persistent one fi fighter. And since my favorite you, one. Since you mentioned it being able to shrug off pain that would cripple others, um, it's my favorite one. Is this a case of man literally too angry to die? Yes. Yes, it is. It's okay. So one of the things that I I believe everybody with chronic illness or anybody who struggles with depression or anybody that has any real issue in their life even if it's not a chronic issue we go through a lot of shit as humans life is fucking hard and i think on some level everybody can relate to this we've all had tough times we've all had things that we thought i'm never going to get through this but the most important thing that i've learned having to deal with chronic pain right my body hurts all the time is it's going to happen whether i like it or not you know, I can I can sit here and I can say, oh, man, this is so hard. Uh, uh, you know, what am I going to do? And it's just going to happen anyway. It's going to fuck me up anyway. And there's nothing I can do about it. So at a certain point, you just have to say, OK, what am I going to do? You know, am I going to sit here and am I, I'm going to I'm going to just take it and I'm going to wallow in misery or am I going to find some way by struggling? And it's hard. Don't get me wrong. It's hard. I mean, I can say, you know, find a way to live above it all I want. But the reality is it's. And it's different for everybody else, but it, it is hard. But we figure it out. Human beings are incredibly adaptable to ridiculously difficult circumstances. And at some point, you're going to have to learn to live above it. At some point, you're going to have to say, all right, this sucks. This is terrible. This is, this, I'm, I'm suffering. I'm hurting. How do I turn it into armor? How do I turn it into a weapon? How do I learn to make this part of me that's not going anywhere second nature to me how do i make myself better mm -hmm. that's what was based off of the persistent one so in it is a is a representation of that type of fighter and we don't have that 
in the fighter subclass. We don't have angry man refuses to die in fighter, but I figured it, that's the best place to put it. Is it is in fighter? You know, so the idea isn't like a barbarian where I'm just like, oh, I'm so angry and I'm gonna. It, no, it's 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 a fighter who learned how to take so much suffering that they just shrug it off. They're just like, okay, it hurts, but that's me. My life is pain. That's that's what I'm dealing with. And they all come from Mardikill. So sometimes you get people who in in this setting that just I don't know, maybe they went adventuring in Mardikill. Maybe they they're part of the uh, Behemoth Butchers, which is a faction that goes and tries to kill behemoths because they have magical energy and maybe some behemoths are fighting and that's disrupting the magical energy of a, of, of a, a part in the world and so they hi somebody hires the behemoths uh, behemoth butchers to go down there and kill them right so they, maybe you're one of those guys and you go down there and you kill behemoths and then oh shit you're you, you got, kind of got lost and uh, you know Marta kills a big place it's an entire sub layer of the world easy to get lost easy to get crushed easy to not find your way back and maybe you're down there for a bit too long and eventually this becomes your life mm -hmm. and when you get out you're not the same as you were before you are a, a person who has endured things that would cripple most people mm -hmm. so next on, next on the list is one is one that well I can well it's one of, it's one that's going to be relevant to my interest for very obvious reasons I'll see what I can do. <laughs> the way of the infused fist. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> another another favorite. Um, this I will admit is less about game design. This one's kind of a a, a personal favorite of mine. I was gonna find a way to shoehorn this in, regardless of whether or not it was a good or a bad idea. Fortunately, it turned out to be a pretty good idea. It, it was probably the one that took me the longest to actually balance effectively. But we don't have a monk subclass that relies on the concept of I'm using your own powers against you. And there's so much of this in, especially in uh, fighting cinema, which is uh, whether it's um, the concept of, I, I don't know, judo or aikido, Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not a martial arts expert, but the idea that either I'm using your own body against you, or I'm using your your um, momentum against you, or in in the case of this subclass, I'm literally just taking your shit and using it against you. And I was kind of inspired a little bit by Kirby, and kind of inspired a little bit by Mega Man, and kind of a little bit inspired by uh, you know uh, these these martial arts that that did this sort of thing. Why don't we have a subclass where I can punch a T-Rex in the face and ha turn my fist into a fire-breathing T-Rex thing? Why don't we have that? <laughs> Where's that? So I made it. Yeah, and I do. I do recall us. I do recall when when we were pre-gaming that we had made some an analogies to um, blue magic. But yes, I suppose blue I magic. Suppose, um, I suppose we could. I suppose somebody could make references to Mega Man, and the thing is, is that is that this 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 particular take of using using powers using someone's powers against them, um, you go in, you go into the weird and wonderful world of Wuxia, and you see a lot of it. So you so you're definitely not far off. Um, now the the next one I wanted to ask is on the oath of determinism, especially since. It is all. It seems to be all about manipulating fate. Yeah, that was a tough one. That's probably one of the ones that the idea came before the execution, because I didn't really have any idea how I was going to do it. Um, but I, I have a particular uh, affinity for a player in my group who hates dice, and. As I look through the community, I realize that I that they are not alone in their hating of dice. There are plenty of players out there who think they are dice cursed, and maybe they are. I don't know who am I to say whether or not they're dice cursed. I'm not at their tables, but I sure know a lot of people who habitually roll ones when they don't don't need to. And for those people, I was like, okay, if I take one of the classes just one and try to 
give them some abilities that render the dice moot as much as I can without breaking the game. How do I do that? And there, there, there was a couple of abilities in 5th edition, specifically like Reliable Talent, that says, okay, well, you, you're really good at this thing, so you roll a dice and you can't get below a 9. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, rely, re- Reliable Talent, in a lot of people's minds, myself included, is OP as hell. It is, it is borked. I love Reliable Talent, and I also think that it is crazy good. So it's like, all right, I can't just take reliable talent because, you know, I'm not going to just supplant that into a different class. But I want to take the idea of reliable talent. And what else doesn't really have a lot of manipulation that's based on the idea of chance, advantage and disadvantage? Mm -hmm. So if I've I've, I've got a religion in Dratalia, and it is um, based on the god Yathlos, and my... Ooh... I have. Uh, I, I live in Texas. I have lots of thunderstorms, and there's rockets around where I am. So if you hear deep booming stuff, that's what's going on. Ah. Um, I don't know if you heard it, but that's what it is. Hmm. Um, so I have a religion in uh, Dratelia. All my gods are kind of... They're not really gods of the harvest, or gods of the dwarves, or gods of the... Um, I don't know. Gods of w- whatever. Mm-hmm. They are ideas. They're based on ideologies. They're based on... Um, concepts in 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 general, and Yathlos, one of the gods of of that is primarily worshipped by humans, is a, a deterministic god. They believe that everyone control Yathlos's teachings would tell you that everyone is in charge of their own destiny, and everyone can control their fate to a certain degree, but for the things that are outside of their control truly outside of their control man is blameless mm-hmm. so the idea of determin- determinism is how do I get this paladin to mess with advantage and disadvantage and mess with dice rolls to honestly to get this kind of close to the idea we were talking earlier to get as close to 10 as possible mm-hmm. so it allow- allows these paladins to kind of not roll low if they want to but it's an aura, so they have to be in. Obviously, they have to be in in a certain radius of that stuff to be affecting other things. But the idea is okay. Let's if if a monster has advantage, I want to be able to give them disadvantage or not not advantage or disadvantage. Nothing, just nothing. Whatever whatever happens happens. That's kind of like the fate deal. And then if you want to change the fate a little bit, uh, you're manipulating the dice to make sure you're hitting minimums. But at at a certain there's there's certain costs involved in that too. So. It's not just like, hey, you're always going to roll a, uh, really well. There's there's kind of a, a, a dynamic, a playback, a risk versus reward thing going on there without getting into too much detail about the class. Mm-hmm. That was hard to do, yeah. though. That was, yeah. that was tough. Mm-hmm. Now, the Behemoth Trapper, with, which, which, it, which seems to focus on... Um, on, um, the, on, just, on just messing around with... The, with Bat- with the battlefield, um, mm-hmm. that is one that that is one that I'm go- I'm going to find interesting because the ranger has had a has had a rough go of it for yeah, decades. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. Um, so just a quick plug: the Ra- Behemoth Ranger subclass is a subclass that I have have given as a preview for anybody who has backed the Kickstarter. So if you're a supporter of the Kickstarter, or if you support the Kickstarter in the future before it ends, uh, you will immediately have access to the Behemoth Trapper as a subclass. And I am making a habit of involving my backers as we go. So even after the campaign is over, uh, I'm going to be giving updates and preview packets where I'm allowing my backers to pl- be playtesting this sort of material. So monsters, classes, subclasses, uh, spells, magic items, cities. Uh, generally, these packets will be going out incrementally, and in the first one, just as a teaser, is this one, the Behemoth Trapper. Mm-hmm. Um, the Behemoth Trapper was born of two things. One, the, the ranger fantasy um, of being able to um, uh, manipulate larger monsters uh, is not really being used currently in 5e and I will cite the scene in Lord of the Rings where Legolas 
jumps on a giant elephant creature. Forgive me, Lord of the Rings fans, for not knowing what that is called. I just remember how cool it is that he got up there and shot arrows and grappled and then swung around and got on the its tail and shot some more arrows and then run up its back and shot some more arrows in its face. And then it falls over and it he slides off the trunk and then, you know, does a rule of cool pose. And that just seemed really badass to me. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'd like to do that. That's, you know, I signed up for Ranger because I want to do that. Why don't I do, get to do that? Mm-hmm. And I have a lot of really big beasties in my world. So I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to let him do that. So Behemoth Trapper is the, it takes a, the idea of I'm going to be able to disable this monster. And when it is disabled, I'm going to be able to climb it. And when I climb it, I'm going to be able to ride it around and move it and make it go where I want to go. Because to me, the idea of lassoing a creature's tusks and guiding it so it slams into a wall and caves in half the ceiling and knocks down a whole bunch of ceiling debris that crushes a bunch of goblins is friggin' cool. And I would like to facilitate that in games where ranger players want to do similar things. So if you like the idea of throwing traps down and incapacitating monsters and riding them around, (laughs) Mammoth Trapper is the way to go. But I will say, if you're worried that it only affects creatures that are larger, it does not. It just gains you bonuses Mm -hmm. for the larger the creature you do. Because if I just made it, oh, well, it only affects large creatures, then you're fighting a bunch of goblins and you're just like, oh, shit, I'm not doing anything. My subclass is useless. No. It, It gives you bonuses the larger the creature is. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking maybe I, I, I got this suggestion from one of my backers, uh, manipulating the idea of getting bonuses when a creature's speed has been reduced to zero. That's a design space that was suggested to me, and I think, you know, that's a really interesting idea. I might, I might look into that because I think I can do some cool stuff with this. Mm-hmm. Now, with, with, that in, with that in mind, when it comes to... Hang, hang on, I had, to, I had to scroll a bit because... I, because oh, it's totally fine. This would be a fantastic <laughs> place to take a really quick break, if that's cool. Uh, yeah, hang on. So, continuing continuing on, I, I know... Now, this one was in the pre, in the preview, but um, when it comes to the Bolt Dervish, um, and it, th- and it throwing it, and it throwing, el- it throwing knives, I... I end up one archetype that I that I see I see get dipped into a lot with rogue is what's known as the flying blade. Essentially, mm-hmm. essentially, this is for those who really really love thrown weapons. Is the bolt dervish kind of an elemental spin on that flying blade concept? Yeah. Have you taken a look at the subclass preview? Yeah. What you What did you think? What did, What are your impressions of it? Um. I would say I would say I would say I I do I do like what it's doing, uh, but it is it is very clear that it is me- that it is meant for, it is meant for those who want who want to lean who want to lean into the fly the flying blade archetype. Um, mm-hmm. So it might it might be best to put it to put a bit of an aside that that um if that if you, that it's recommended to use this if you want if you want to specialize in throwing weapons generally speaking it it, it makes its own weapons mm-hmm. so you can equip whatever kind of rogue weapon you like when when working with the bolt dervish the bolt dervish makes its own elemental throwing knives through its ability mm-hmm. and the, the two most important design tenets for this one and it is by far my most complicated and complex subclass in in the entire book it takes up two whole pages by itself mm-hmm. and that was me trimming it down for for trying to make it as concise as possible and the reason why is these two main design tenets number one is I wanted to be able to do, let it do rogue things that the rogue can't currently do. There's a, a subset of rogue players that feel that the rogue in Dungeons and Dragons, and I don't know about other editions, but at least in 5e, doesn't do some of the classic things that you would expect a rogue to do. For example, this was espoused to me, why can't a rogue cut off a wizard's vocal cords to stop it from casting a spell. Why can't a rogue 
slice the t the heel tendons of a creature to stop it from moving. These are all things that a master rogue or thief or assassin w would and should be able to do and have done in countless archetypes. So I was like, all right, I'm going to facilitate that. And the second main tenet that really made this subclass take off for me was the idea of tandem attacks. A bolt dervish can essentially summon four blades. Uh, primary cardinal elements. Uh, fire, air, earth, uh, water? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So it can summon those. Once it uses one of those, it can use it for an effect that's a typical rogue effect. Something that you would expect a rogue to do. Uh, toss a blade, hits you in the chest, teleports behind you, nothing personal, kid. Uh, throws a blade, ricochets off a wall, hits somebody around the corner that nobody has actual line of sight to, uh, even your wizard. Uh, but the tandem attacks are when you get this idea that you can throw a blade, but you know, give it the abilities of one of the other ones. So the water blade has abilities, the fire blade has different abilities, the air blade has different abilities, and the earth blade has different abilities but let's say you want to burn the fire blade but you have your earth blade available to you as long as you still have an ability one of your blades available to you you haven't expended it it can be used in tandem with another blade to give that you are burning to give sub effects so let's say i want to i want to teleport behind an enemy who is around a corner and doing a patrol i can't do that now, a normal rogue would just be like, okay, I'm just going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to stealth. That's boring. You stealth everywhere. Rogue, rogue wants to do something cool. Rogue player wants to do something cool. So, they want to throw their water blade. The water blade, throw, you hit somebody with the water blade and you teleport behind them. But you can't hit them from around the corner. So, as long as you have, say, the Earth Blade, the Earth Blade creates kind of this mirror effect that allows things, other blades to ricochet. That's a tandem attack. So, if I have the Earth Blade, I throw the Water Blade, Water Blade gets expunged, bounces off the available Earth Blade, and boom, I'm teleporting around the corner and doing rogue shit. Now, my Water Blade is expunged. So, now, later on, I can't use the passive effect of the Water Blade until I rest and get them all back. I've used it. Mm -hmm. And when create when you, this risk reward thing of when I want to use my abilities and whatnot. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go yeah, ahead. When you when you mention doing th doing things that doing iconic thief things, um, the first thing that came to mind is Garrett, um, from the th from like Thief the Dark Project and um the and Thief the Metal Age. Yeah, one of my my uh, players is a huge thief fan. Mm -hmm. And his and um, his whole thing his whole thing within it has has always been having a host of different kinds of trick arrows, mm -hmm. and in and in some cases su suffering through suffering through weirdly de weirdly designed places because I will never forgive whoever thought the thieves guild was a good idea. <laughs> they do have some kind of weird design in that game. Oh. Well, the th the thieves the concept of the thieves guild is is a nice idea. You got two you have two thieves guilds who are at, who who are at odds with each other, and Garrett is just going to steal both of their both of their loots. The problem is it way 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 overstays its welcome. It it's like the Energizer Bunny Bunny. It keeps going. I will confess, I could never get through the games. Mm -hmm. Um, but. Now, when it, when it comes to the malaise warlock, that warlocks are an, warlocks are an interesting bunch. Which, um, unfortunately, I don't like how I don't like what one D and D is doing with them. But what don't you like in 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 particular? Just my own personal opinion, so I can know what to avoid. <sighs> it seemed like it seemed like somebody missed the point, or at least or at least missed what people like about warlocks, because. The big appeal, the big selling point when it comes to warlocks is yes, they have the they have the smallest amount of spell slots of anybody, even even among half casters. But they get their spells back on a short rest, and their spells automatically scale. 
all of the, that ki that kind of thing that I mentioned got taken out in favor of making of just making them a different kind of half caster. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is a case of missing of missing the point. Yeah, I always thought the point was, I want to be able to save my own ass in ridiculous circumstances that a normal caster would not be able to do because I have this power that I'm relying on and I have to sacrifice things in order to get it. Well, there there is that, but that's that's on the narrative end. I'm I'm right. mostly talking on the, the, on the mechanical end. Yeah, and that particular thing of of be, of not having to worry about specific spell levels, but the fact that when you cast the spells that you have, it's always at a specific level. Um, that is some that is something that in the playtest has been ta has been taken out, and I feel like it's. I feel like it's a case of mi of missing the appeal because just making them half casters, the argument that they make is that they is that they're going to get more slots. Except they're not. They're by the time they get any slots of any decency, it's are it's already way into the teens. So let me, let me explain what my design process was behind it, and then you can tell me whether or not you think that I'm achieving that. Yeah. Because if not. Remember that I can. I've got a, about a year to make this, and although ninety ninety five ish percent of the book is already finished, there's plenty of opportunity for playtesting mm -hmm. and and working through stuff. And especially if I, I get it like a, a like a little design kernel, or can I go off in another direction, or really add something to to these classes to make them as best as I possibly can. Really, the goal here is not to just make a book that serves me. It's to make a book that serves everybody who wants to play in this world and and have these archetypes and facilitate these play styles. So I'm totally open to hearing your opinion on where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. The idea is, with the Malaise Warlock, is it is channeling the negative energy that is in the lower layer of the world that has the dysfunction and sickness. It's channeling that kind of essence um, and there is in case you don't want to necessarily just channel that one essence if you don't like the narrative idea of a negative energy being the catalyst for these powers because it is a massive negative energy of the world, mm -hmm. which I think is a neat take. There are also a couple of particularly strong beings that have really dragged that energy into themselves mm -hmm. and they they represent like the paragons of that negative energy so even if you don't like the idea of just being like well I get it from negative space you can channel them these kind of terror beasts as your patron but the idea is that the weaker that you get as a warlock, the more energy that you expel, uh, the more options and, and strength that you get. And it really ties into the concept of the entire world where the more energy that I use as a person with the what's called post-exertional malaise, that is my actual condition where the, the more I do stuff, post-exertion, I get tired. Since warlocks really kind of mess around with spell slots, the more they do, the more they use, the less they have, the weirder things get. Mm -hmm. And I'm perfectly fine with, with that, especially since it's giving options. Since um, a bit of a bit of a issue I've, I've had with how people, with how the warlock has been treated is there's this there's this very strong narrative element that I feel a lot of people don't tap into. That being that um, warlocks have made a, have made a deal with somebody in order to get their magic, which means that mm -hmm. there's somebody that they're answerable to. And when we look at when we look at characters who um, have made some sort of deal with the devil, there is a certain agenda that they ha that they have to go with to keep up their end of the bargain. Um, mm -hmm. The big example that I end up I end up using for a lot of people is um, Shadow Man, aka Doctor Facilier, in The Princess and the Frog, and how his the thing that undoes him is the is the fact that his focus got got wrecked and he couldn't keep up his end of the deal with his friends. Right. And 
you look at a lot of cases where somebody makes a makes some sort makes some sort of pact and there's usually usually some sort of price for it and usually some sort of um of they ha there there are things that they have to do even if, even if it's not what they want to because they made that deal um deal with the devil is ob is obviously the e the easy answer but it's not it's not the the be all end all of this kind of thing obviously <clears throat> right i actually did take a different approach with that mm -hmm. so so you've already got the warlock subclasses that have been made uh pretty much covers just about anything you can think of of that classic motif you, you got your your devil patrons you've got your great old one cthulhu style patrons you've got your trickery fey patrons and for, for the most part there's already going to be something uh, some patron some subclass that allows you to make any kind of narrative you want uh, like if, you, for example, you go with the the archfey, and that that narrative for that warlock player is going to be trying to outsmart maybe their uh, their fey patron or the the great old one patron is you're you're trying to outfear your your you're like I'm not afraid of you kind of style narrative that they're going for. The, 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 those have all been covered. What I wanted to do with this warlock is give the warlock a patron that doesn't feel the need for any of that ambition so a lot of these these creatures these these archfey these devils these demons these cthulhu-esque uh, beings they have an agenda they have a thing that they want and and what if you had a patron that wasn't phased by any of that stuff mm -hmm. what if you had a patron that was just like I have my own idea and I'm down here and I exist and I am generally speaking a very negative energy being but what if you can't bargain with me what if what if I want to grant you power and what I want from you is more ephemeral mm -hmm. what if what I want from you is a mystery what if it's more undefined what if what if I want to lure you down here before you even have any clue what I am or what I could possibly want? Mm -hmm. And so as a means of getting players who want to play in the world of Jitalia and play in, in that particular warlock epic, that's getting them down into the bad place. That's getting them down into the, the mysterious, difficult area and giving them a reason to be there. But for people who want to just take that warlock and play it in their own games, it gives GMs an opportunity to be mysterious with the, the wants and the desires of that patron because it is not necessarily a, a thing. It's it, it could be a feeling. It could be an energy or it could be something that took in that energy and has a completely different idea of what it wants. So it really kind of... I, I, look, I looked to GMs for that. What kind of stories do they want to facilitate for their players? Mm -hmm. Now, the the last one, the Barrier Magic Wizard... Um... We're going to miss Sorcerer. Miss Sorcerer. <laughs> Oh yeah, I forgot. I, I completely. <laughs> it's okay. uh, I almost forgot it too. I yeah. almost did, and I was like, "Wait a minute! Wait, isn't there uh, one more?" <laughs> yeah, the S infusion alterant sorcerer. Um, yeah, let's do that one. Now, sor sorcerer is a very easy way—a very easy way to do blaster caster. Um, uh -huh. And I'm get I'm guessing with the inf with the infusion um, alterant, it's 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 not a it's more of a it's more of uh, messing around with messing around with with weaknesses rather than blasting. It is exactly that. Yes, that is a fantastic guess. Mm -hmm. So, infusion alterant. Uh, tons of people like casting spells and changing the effects of spells. And I've heard from so many people and read from so many people in the community and see, heard examples of so many tables where people were just like, "I want to cast fireball, but I want it to be a giant death skull." 
why can't I do that? And I want to cast uh, Fireball, but I want it to be Ice. And then so many other people are just like, well, why don't we have an Elementalist uh, Sorcerer? And I'm like, all right, I don't want to just do Elementalist Sorcerer because I know Pathfinder has Kineticist. And it's kind of low-hanging fruit. I'm sure if I do it, somebody else who's better at designing than me will come along and do it better. And, and then, then I'm, you know, what? Fish out of water. Then, then, then people are like, okay, well, I'm going to go with this. It's a wasted slot. So I got to I got to take a different approach. So I was like, okay, I'm going to start with the idea of expanding on what Tosh's Cauldron of Everything did and and let people change their spells, which is way overdue anyway, but it can't be just that. So let's mess with weaknesses. Why not allow the sorcerer to say, okay, I I've seen this monster before. Fighters can do something similar where they size up a creature and they get to learn one of the subclasses I think it is gets to learn uh, whether or not this, it's better than them in hit points and armor class or other things. Uh, why not let the sorcerer use its skills to figure out a, from its massive compendium of sorcery and knowledge of the arcane arts to know that, okay, well, this pit fiend is, you know, he's got a big fire axe. Um, maybe he's pretty good against fire. Maybe I shouldn't hit him with fire. Uh, maybe, but I got fireball. That sucks. <laughs> Maybe let's 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 not just turn our fireball into an ice ball. Let's let's hit him with a with a a, a a spell that he is not necessarily weak against yet. Let's change the way of that the, the, the typing of that spell, hit him with it, then make him weak to it, and then have to keep doing that process without hitting the same type of spell. So, for example, this is not just a subclass where you're like, I'm going to hit him with an ice ball, and then I'm going to make him weak to ice, and then I'm just going to go get double damage, which is OP as hell. No, you're messing with the weaknesses, and then constantly changing the typings of your spells to work with the rest of your team to try to facilitate them to be doing more damage with their types as well. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a never the same way twice. There are yeah. some restrictions in place to stop this caster from constantly doubling up on, on weakness, but it's changing your spells types every time you cast it and changing the retro, like reactively changing the weakness of the, the monster as a result to kind of work with your team to, to be manipulating your spells like almost every turn. Mm-hmm. So, and of course, that that brings us to the barrier magic wizard. Which yep. the funny thing is, is that there's a whole there's a whole sphere of, there's a whole sphere of magic within the D, within the D and D spheres of magic that is all about de- that is all about defense, but it is so mm-hmm. rarely taken advantage of fully. And I'm I'm talking about abjuration. Yes, abjuration is pretty much the closest thing to an inspiration for barrier magic. But I mean, I'm I'm going off in a different direction entirely, so mm-hmm. it's more of an augmentation thing. But yeah, um, abjuration is at least somewhat relatable. Mm-hmm. It's so. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Sure, it's all you. It's just that um, the. Even even though even though abjuration is is meant to be used as a defensive measure, um, a lot of times when I see people play wizards, which admittedly isn't as often, wizard has seems to have the lo- seems to have the lowest pick rate when it comes to the casting classes. Um, the wi- the wizard the a lot of times people people will use wizards for either offense or either direct or indirect offense. Um, but the idea the idea of fo- of focusing on ba- on barriers, I didn't I didn't see all that much until the anime Kakaishi happened, and then I saw a few people suggesting it, giving get, asking if they could do that after after they ended up seeing that series. Well, I don't I have not seen that anime, but maybe let me know when I describe the. The subclass. If I'm in the the ballpark for that. All right, go ahead. So I don't know. Maybe maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. But okay. So the the barrier wizard is based almost entirely in the lore of of Drutelia. 
the one of the most important parts of Jitelia is Magitech, and a lot of my backers are asking me this, so uh, th this will be a great spot for a timestamp for the the backers who really want to know about Magitech. Mm -hmm. So Ma Magitech in in Dratelia is a direct response to the, the the crap that goes on in the world. It is a protective measure to stop all these natural disasters that are happening in the world of Dratelia as a result of the dysfunction that happens in the lower layer. It permeates every aspect of the surface. You've got the land waves, you've got the behemoths, you've got all the other shit that's going on as a result of the world itself being dysfunctional that's really bad for cities and so cities like I said earlier have to build tall but they also had to build these barriers because there's no way in hell that they're going to be able to stop a hundred foot land wave or a massive 80 foot kaiju of a behemoth from attacking a city if you don't have some sort of precautionary defensive measure in place but you're also not going to see anybody shy of a level 20 wizard casting a barrier that covers an entire city. So what do you have to do? you got to come up with some lore for that. So there's a, a, a mage college slash educational location slash, I don't know, um, development, Magitech development um, building uh, called Corvuspire. Corvuspire is the convocation of the Arcane. They're a, basically a magic school that they also dabble in the development of um, Magitech stuff and protecting things via magic. And one of their deals is they realize pretty early on that once you see your entire city go crumbling and being subsumed by a giant earthquake and going back into the earth that maybe you want to do something about that. So that Barrier magic is all about augmentation. It's about taking the idea of a spell and amplifying it. And they do this through these things called barrier uh, pylons. They're these giant kind of sending, uh, standing stones that are infused with magic that they will place around a city. And once all of those barriers are uh, uh, pylons are placed around the city, they act as kind of like a, an augmentation for a very specific subset of spell. Mm -hmm. From that, a, a an envoy of the of Corvuspire, the Convocation of the Arcane, is taught how to use these pylons to amplify their magic for protective measures, and they will go. They will be hired as a conscriptionist for living and working in a city, kind of like as a, a job placement. And they hang out in this kind of centralized area where there's another one of these standing stones and their job essentially all day is kind of like a security guard. And they will make sure that when bad shit happens, like a land wave is coming or a behemoth is showing up or, uh, you know, the large scale invasion is, is showing up from political issues or, uh, you know, an airship is going to crash into the city. The, their job is to use these the power of these placed pylons to make a barrier that they would never be able to make realistically unless they were a level 20 wizard or a, or a, an entire group of level 20 wizards all working together it allows this one barrier mage to do things that they can't do mm -hmm. so this, this subclass relies uh, a little bit on magic items but it's given a wondrous item at the beginning of its subclass it's kind of like its specialized tool and it can plant a, a barrier pylon, a, a mobile barrier pylon, not a, not one of the larger sending stones, but a Magitech item that's like a rod that they can jam into the ground that serves as kind of like a mobile miniature pylon. And that pylon can be used to augment their barrier magic like a paladin's aura does for defensive purposes. So it's not like a wizard is just going around being like, shield everybody, shield everybody, everybody gets five, seven, 10 AC to their their class and we're busted and uh, nobody ever picks a subclass and you can't kill us. It's it's kind of like picking a spot mm -hmm. and then being like, I'm going to make this spot really awesome. If you'd like to be more awesome than you already are, you should go there. Yeah, because I'm I'm picking this and I'm focusing my energy on that. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what the barrier mage is, and I, I just I really wanted to play with the idea of giving a class a magic item that was unique to them and just letting them go ham on it. I had one player do this where they put they were they were crashing an airship into a city and rather than they were all in in the hull of the the interior I don't know if it's a hull the interior part of the airship 
and they were gonna they were gonna pretty much just crash into this massive building and do a ton of damage and most likely die. But the they uh, planted the uh, barrier down in the hull of the airship. It made a little barrier thing, and then they just kind of hamster balled their way out of it. Well, the airship crashed into the uh, into the castle and just poof, everywhere. And they're just like boink 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 hamster ball. Just we had a little chuckle while it was rolling, and then came to a stop. Yeah, and with that in mind, since since we since we kind of danced around it, um, since Magitech contraptions is one is one of the big things, it's just Magitech as a whole. Um, I'm cur I'm curious what what are some of the things that would separate it from either normal items or even magic items. Okay, so I was very conscious of other settings that dabble in Magitech when I was designing this so that I wasn't really going to step on anybody's toes. But there's still only so much that you can do with the concept of Magitech. So a lot of examples of your basic Magitech is not too dissimilar from what you would expect. Um, items that are general use, that are in everyday households, that allow people to... Um, properly advance or develop society, uh, such as an automated uh, plow for taking care of agriculture. But the the areas that I wanted to go with Magitech is is a little bit different because when a magic user or a group of magic users or a city who is properly trying to use magic to hasten the development of their city uses too much magic in an area that drains the life of the planet in that area that slows and makes the mag magic the virescence uh, uh, of that area sluggish and it, uh, it it affects the world and it makes cracks in the world and it brings the the problems and the dysfunction of Mardukil in the lower layer to the surface and creates surface problems it mirrors the malaise of my chronic fatigue syndrome on the surface so you can't use that too much but magitech in this setting alleviates the problem for that a little bit you can you can collect this the the source of magic the virescence from the bloom fonts this is what makes bloom fonts so instrumental in city development and why every bloom font pretty much is either fought over or has a city already built around it take Leventali, the major settlement around a wind bloom font. People who live in Leventali can jump massive distances across the city as a form of travel because the air bloom font that controls the magic in that area is augmented by the bloom font in the city. That's just one example. Earth bloom fonts, fire bloom fonts, air bl uh, water bloom fonts all have similar effects, but they also, as plants, uh, they dispense this material called bloom powder mm -hmm. into the atmosphere. That can be collected. It can be harvested. It's constantly throwing this into the atmosphere. So instead of having to use raw magic and hurting the world and, and imbalancing the world and causing this dysfunction, you can collect bloom dust and use this as a material component in spell casting that alleviates the need to just rip raw virescence out of the atmosphere and and cause natural problems and imbalance the world so that makes that a pretty important resource but it's also fairly abundant as long as you are around a bloom font which creates political tension mm -hmm. all all mages in dratelia as as a part of a lore are are brought up from a very young age, from the very beginning that, that they have their powers, to understand that you don't rip raw virescence out of the atmosphere. You don't raw dog your spells because it hurts the world. It doesn't just hurt you. It doesn't just hurt everybody around you. It doesn't just make the world a worse place. It harms the world. And all you, all anybody has to do is look up at the sky at this looming cloned planet that went to shit and and something happened to it where it is pretty much all completely torpid to see what happens if they abuse this power so every mage is outfitted with this kind of i guess the, the closest thing would be a pit boy from fallout 
It's a little uh, Magitech device that goes on their arm, and it can store bloom powder. And you only need a little bit of bloom powder to, to do what you need to do, but as long as you're using bloom powder as a resource, you're not pulling from the dysfunction of the world. You're not harming anything. And as a subset of a mechanic, what it allows people to do is anybody who doesn't like, um, I don't know, smearing bat guano all over their fingertips before they cast a spell, <laughs> it gives them an alternative, uh, easily accessible material component mm -hmm. for them to have cast rather than just, you know, cycling through their inventory all the time and having to pick out individual stuff. They can just be like, nah, I got bloom dust. Mm -hmm. Now... With that, with that in mind, um, when it comes to like one of the one of the things I definitely found interesting when I was going through the preview is the w the way you um s the way you described and set and set up the city of Leventali because cool. you, we have we have the we have the kind of city that is in the re the regions um what ma what makes up the population of of it. Um, some of some of its history, um, society, gov government, um, eco economy, as well as as well as a few um, rumor mills, I'll call them. I, it it's mm -hmm. listed in there as interesting things about Latali, but um, but um, but that and a, f a few other things I kind of put as rumor mills as, as a catch-all mm -hmm. in my in my head. But I'm I'm guessing that for mo for most of the major regions that that. You're gonna, that you're going to be showing within the book, it's going to be in the in the same kind of detail. Yep. Yeah, not not exactly because Leventali is a, is a huge city, so you're going to get more information on Leventali because there's more things to do in that area. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that is the most, and this is probably the one of the most crucial things for anybody who is considering supporting this project or who might be interested in Drutelia as a book in the future. Mm -hmm. There is a problem that a lot of people in the community and a lot of players, I'm sure, have to deal with when it comes to settings. And that is, a lot of them are bare bones on information. They are giving you just the least amount of information possible and then telling you, okay, here's 15, here's 20, here's maybe 25 pages of setting information at the max you do the rest of the work, Dungeon Master. You come up with this stuff on your own. And I'm like, no. I, I, I cannot, in good conscience, put out a book that's supposed to be, that has the words campaign setting on the front of it, is a brand new world, and not give you the details required to run that setting. I can't do it. So even though Leventali is like eight pages long, even the smaller city, there's 30 cities in this book. 30 cities. I have... I'm going on 130 plus pages so far and counting of just setting, just things, places you can go, things you can see, uh, NPCs you can meet, quests, hooks that you can do, uh, f the, the way that factions interact with these locations that are inside these cities, they're all fleshed out about as well as you would need to from a city. They all have explanations for their economy, for their, their culture, how just some blurbs on how each of the people live their lives in this place, the architecture, so that you can explain it. I, that's another thing that I... And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ramble here. This is one of these topics where I can just go forever if you let me. So rein mm -hmm. me in. <laughs> if I'm going too far, I can go forever on this. Mm -hmm. There, There's some examples where in the book where I realized when I'm going to a city and I'm reading from another person's setting book, I don't know what the architecture is. What do these houses look like? How are they any different from any other houses? What do I do? Just tell, oh yeah, well, it's um, generic fantasy houses. They're made of wood and shit. Like, no. I, I, I have five different races that nobody has ever seen before. They're brand new for this book. What kind of houses do they build? How do they build their architecture? What kind of culture do they bring? What what would they do to a city if there was a mass migration of Ivasa coming out of Mardikil and wanting to emigrate into a world and having culture shock and the elves and the humans in Leventali were just like, yeah, sure, we'll give you a district. What does that arc what does that district look like? How do you describe that to your players? I don't see that in other setting books. Often. I, I know a couple of people do. I've seen some examples. Like I know um uh Taldore Reborn does a really good job of this uh, but everything you will need to know generally speaking about a city is going to be in this book if it's a small city it might be one to two pages 
mm-hmm. right? It's gonna be it's gonna have all the same information you need. It will be more truncated from say a three hundred thousand population mecca, which is gonna be more six pages long. But everything you're gonna need to run every city is going to be in there, as well as like you said, some some rumor mills because you've got to have you got to have a quest board. When people come into a city, you got to have something for them, them to do. There's nothing worse than you get players coming into a, a new town and then they're like, okay, well, what is there to do, DM? And you're like, um, well, I don't know. There's, you know, there's people, you know, making stuff and doing jobs. What do you want to do? No, things have to be happening in that town, regardless of whether they are the players are there or not. And I go a little bit into this in a later section where I have GM tips on how to run your games. But one of the questions I hear the most often is, how do you make a world alive? How do you make a living world? And the best way to do that, at least in my perspective, have shit going on in towns, progressing, while the players aren't there. Mm -hmm. People have day-to-day lives that they're going about, and and your heroes might be off gallivanting in another town. Well, some of the threads that they did in that town before might progress. Write a little note. Hmm, well, you know, the they did this quest and they stopped the necromancer, so um, you know, what effects does that have on the town? That yeah. those kind of quest hooks are in this book. So if you need if you need quest hooks, if you need things for your players to do, if you just need a jumping off point for an adventure, there, I've got like between one and three of these quest hooks for every city and every region in the book. Mm-hmm. And they just they're, they're they're just jumping off points for you to go in and just like here. Here you go. This is what's happening in the town. This is what the town's like. This is who you're going to find here. This is the economy of the town. Here are the rulers. This is what they're doing. This is what they have done. Go make an adventure. Yep. Now, with the with that in mind, I I know there's the there's always the there's always complications with this kind of thing. But what are you shooting for as far as a page count? Like two hundred? Uh, no, about three hundred. Oh. I want yeah. a thick boy. <laughs> uh, so, so right, right now, right now, if I format my text into the the uh, the the program that I'm running for making the book, which is uh, Affinity Publisher mm-hmm. that I'm running uh, to play test everything and, and and make sure everything's working fine. No formatting, no artwork placed, just raw dog in it. I'm looking at almost 200 pages of just solid text, mm-hmm. and that will expand by about 10% when I add formatting. And then after that, when I add the art, that's going to add another 30, 40% of, of space that's just getting chunked up by by artwork. I don't know how I'm going to get under 260. Mm-hmm. So, so we're looking somewhere at least 260 and I'm shooting for 300 because I don't, I don't see how I'm going to be able to make a book that, covers the entirety of what Dratelia is as a world and gives game masters all the tools they need to run every single one of these cities without having about 130 plus pages of text that is just devoted entirely to the world. And then from there, we, what, we have all the subclasses, the introduction to the world, the magic items that are in there, the, the all the monsters, which are going to take up quite a bit of space because there's, these behemoths have big stat blocks. I, I give every one of my behemoths several abilities because of the Dark Souls and Monster Hunter references that we talked about earlier. These guys are, are dynamic as hell. So I'm at the moment, I'm struggling to keep each one of these behemoths under three pages of each. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to do it because on one hand, I've got artwork for each of them, and that's half a page. And then I have um, specific information on how to run each one of these behemoths, their behavior, their ecology, how to run them in combat, what they do when they get, they get cornered, how how their attack progressions go, how do you evolve the fight as it go? That's another half page at least of text. Then I got their stat block, which is almost an entire page in and of itself. And then one of the other things I want to do is I want to allow these behemoths to be younger because they're part of the world. So they've got younger behemoths and baby behemoths and little tiny beastling behemoths because I want to, uh, I spent a lot of time on these monsters. I want you to be able to fight them at CR5. You know, I want you to be like, oh shit, it's a little baby Sarkamuska. And then the baby Sarkamuska, you, you, you're a fan of Monty Python. Yeah. I mean, is the Pope okay. Catholic? <laughs> yeah, who isn't a fan of Monty Python? So, Rabbit of Karnabog. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have... want you to 
be a little tiny ba- baby behemoth and be like, oh, it's a little cute behemoth. What's that going to do? Bite your face off? Fuck yeah, it's going to bite your face off. Um, when I was do- when I was doing a um, when I was doing a live stream of, pl- of playing um, Shadow Warrior, um, I had there would there would be rabbits that would occasionally show up, and I made it a habit of shooting every one of them. And some and somebody asked why why you do that? That might be the killer rap. I said that might be the killer rabbit. And it's like you don't know that. I know that now because it's dead. Yep. <laughs> it's dead now. It ain't. It wasn't it. <laughs> yeah. And hey, on my my screen name everywhere is third strongest bunny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's what I go by in almost every single one of my circles on the, my social media. And I've been doing that's been my screen name for like 15 years. And I do not take offense to you killing a bunch of rabbits in pursuit of not getting your face ripped off by a, a rabbit of Canabog or similar. <laughs> You have my permission. Kill them all. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't realize that if you do that too many times, one the rabbit will turn black and start bum rushing you. But okay, um... so I got a, I got a good joke here. This is I haven't been able to do this yet. And if you're in my play group, uh, uh tur- close. You know, n- don't listen to this. Don't listen to this. This is <laughs> later. But I read this. I read. I, I read this on Reddit. I think, and I just I've been wanting to do it ever since. There's a hunter. It's an NPC. He's he's got a rabbit trap. You see him on the trail during downtime in between cities where your, your party is, is traveling. He's got a rabbit trap out, and it's a, a little carrot. And you, he's an NPC. He's the only one on the road. And you, 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 you feel like you're, you maybe want to talk to him. What are you doing, Hunter? How are you? How, how does the hunt go? And he gets pissed at you. That was my rabbit trap. You've scared all the rabbits away. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? You ruined my rabbit trap. He runs off. Mm-hmm. Your party thinks nothing of it. Later on, maybe they've done a couple more quests. They see a hunter on the road. He has a rabbit. A dead rabbit. He caught it. He's using it as bait for another trap. You've seen this hunter before. Maybe you maybe your your party wants to apologize for the earlier transgression. Or maybe they want to just make good on what they did before, or maybe they forget that that was the same hunter. But they approach him all the same. Whoa, Hunter! How goes the hunt? Or, I'm, I'm sorry for the earlier thing. You've disturbed my trap! What are you doing? You're, you're, you're scaring all the dire wolves away. He's using the, he's using the rabbit to, now to, to, to get dire wolves. The next time you see him, he's got a dire wolf. <laughs> that he's hunted. Eventually, he's using a tarask. <laughs> A dead Tarask as bait for some other fucking kaiju. <laughs> and it just keeps getting progressively bigger until it's just like so overwhelmingly just comically stupid <laughs> that it's the same hunter that's just killed he killed a Tarask and using it as what the hell is he using that as bait for? Mm-hmm. Oh. And I I just like that 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 to me I'm gonna I'm gonna use that. Yeah, in my group, in my group, somewhere in my next campaign, it was I don't know who genius thought of that, but it's just it's just such a good idea for an NPC, and it just it harkens back. It doesn't matter how small you are, but you're gonna mess something up. Yeah, that that I'm reminded of two things. One of them is the list called things Skippy the Dwarf is not ha, is not allowed to do in the dungeon, <laughs> which um, is loosely is loosely based off of off of off of an old army joke. Mm-hmm. Because, well, if, if I ever if I ever need a story about people doing dumb things, I can I can just talk to any sol any um, soldier that I know, and they will have at least three stories they can share with me. Oh yeah. For yeah, they're good. If, they're good at that. For if for if they um if they if they ever served at Fort Polk, because nobody I've spoken to likes Fort Polk. Or they're Bangalore from Apex Legends. <laughs> but <laughs> um, there one. I think one of the one of the cases that ma- that made me realize that there w- that there may be some truth to all the crayon jokes I keep hearing about Marines was um, one instance where so- where some f- some folk who had been st- who had been stationed in Iraq they had a they had a portage on where they were they mm-hmm. ran out they ran out of TP and their solution was to use the cl- was to use the cloth that is used to mop up grease. Um, hey, uh, um, better than using your hand. Here's the problem. That cloth has lo- has little bits of fiberglass in it. Oh, why you gotta do me like that, man? 
<laughs> I'm not going to get that out of my head. <laughs> How do you think I feel? <laughs> <laughs> so you have to inflict that pain and suffering on me too? Yes. <laughs> Does that make you feel better? No. <laughs> but I had oh my god. But the the other thing is there is there is one particular um incident that I've I brought up plenty of times because whenever I've played like rogues or th or thieves um I've, I've been less interested in being the sneaky boy and always more interested in being the guy who sets up traps, even though half, yeah, even though half of my traps are blatantly ripped off from Chuck Jones sketches. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, if you're not familiar, he was one of the godfathers of Looney Tunes. Oh yes, yes. Uh, like the vast major the vast majority of ca of characters and, and shorts are credited are credited to him. He is. The so are we talking are we talking like Acme era stuff or before then? We're talking. We're talking Acme era. He ba that okay, was, yeah. he basically I'm, invented I'm, it. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I'm getting. I'm showing my age here, but yeah. But I ended up making a rune trap that was that is called that was affectionately called the up button. <laughs> you step on the tr you step on the tr it is you place it on a f on a five foot area. When somebody steps on it, they go up. Mm-hmm. Basically, they're go they're going straight up as if they cast fly on themselves for about six seconds at forty miles an hour. Like my Strasker thing. <laughs> well, end of end of the campaign, we end up dealing with a dragon in this layer that's lined with adamantite. Mm -hmm. Dragon steps on the trap. He hits within less than a second. He hits the ceiling. Right. And the G and the GM's like, oh, okay, now he comes down and is dealing with damage from hit from hitting the ground. And I I had cut him off saying. Uh, no, he doesn't. He still has. He's he he hasn't gone up six seconds. <laughs> it specifically says it go. You go up six seconds, and you go up six. You go up six seconds, and then you fall down. Mm -hmm. And but he was he had he had said, but but it's adamantite. That's not that's not gonna budge. Spell doesn't nope. care. <laughs> so, dragon puddle. Um, you ever see a car get crushed in a compactor? Yep. That's what happened. <laughs> Dragon puddle. <laughs> yeah, everybody, everybody had to do con saves to avoid losing their lunch. No, uh, yeah. <laughs> what was what type was the dragon? I mean, I imagine that of the effect on the room. Um, black. So everybody oh, right. had to take cover. <laughs> <laughs> acid damage. Nope. Nobody Gross. got acid. Nobody got acid damage, but um, everybody had to take fort saves from the smell. From the smell of all the acid and the smell of all oh, the oh, other oh, you're stuff. in, you're in, you're in three or three five. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Every, everybody, ha everybody had to, everybody had to do con, had had to roll con so to avoid um losing their lunch. See, that's the kind of campaign that I can I can get behind. I love shit like that when people are just not afraid to experiment and and just see where everything goes and crazy shit happens and you're jumping out of airships without parachutes and last minute feather falling and making crazy uh, Rube Goldberg machines to make make mm -hmm. your plans work and um, yeah, I think the in, best kind of, that's I think the best in, kind of party in one case we were in one case we were dealing with a troll and um, my GM was dumb enough to actually agree with me when I said I want a portal gun <laughs> oh you're one of them <laughs> So what I what I did was I sh I shot one end into into the giant's mouth, um, shot another one and du and dumped all and dumped all of the all of the vials of alchemist fire that I had. Mm. I had about fifty. Mm, yeah, but that tickled. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was it could probably be described as the worst indigestion because the keep in mind alchemist fire is. Basically, an all but named Greek fire. Yes, Greek fire yeah. does not go out easy. I I have a player who uh, is a huge fan of fast hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for this reason, yeah. you you would get along really well with my play group. And I think. Even as a GM, I like giving my players very powerful but very unsafe and even dangerous um, equipment. Dangerous, dangerous as much to the enemy as it is to them. Oh yeah, but then you can you can do it as well. So um, then it's it's all good. One of them, one of them was a was what I referred to as a thunder crossbow, and in all but name, it was the noisy cricket from Men in Black. I was gonna say, if you tell me this is a motherfucking Castlevania reference, I will talk your goddamn ear off for the rest of your life. <laughs> no, this time it was it was 
it does a, it does a hell of a lot of thunder damage, but every time you fire it, you're gonna sent, be sent flying the other direction. That works for me. And um, some some people some people thought, okay, we'll just I'll just fire it from the wall. I'll just fire it while leaning against the wall. Nope, that physics doesn't work that way. You take wall damage. Mm, I love wall damage. I I wanna I really want to make. A, a, a class or a subclass or something. I just maybe, maybe a monster. I don't know. That just really relies on 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 wall damage because I just I like the idea and I try to think about this every time I I use air spells or air abilities in my monsters. Is how do you just push people around? Because I I love the idea of just being like, well, yep, splat, mm -hmm. or or just. Holding you up against a wall with massive air pressure is like a crowd control mechanism. Or who doesn't, as a player, and you could probably speak to this, who doesn't like the idea of just sneaking up behind somebody and pushing them off of an edge of a cliff? <laughs> everybody everybody loves that. Entire games, like the entire Assassin's Creed series, or, um, God, there's another game that I can't think of at the moment. Um, Hitman. Yeah. The Hitman series. The, the entire game series are, are built around the idea of just putting stupid shit in places that knock people off of ledges and kill them indiscriminately and people love that shit why yeah. do we get no, why don't we get more air abilities and spells that are really good at pushing people um the 4e monk was notorious for having a lot of forced movement um actions as well as his own specialized moves because of the full discipline rule mm -hmm. where um some of his attacks could also could also be used as their own kind of move action which Sometimes it's a teleport. Sometimes it's a move that puts a that puts um that puts an AOE effect on the places you move. Like you're like you're like you're leaving like you're leaving fire where you step. Um, mm -hmm. And so and some sometimes sometimes you um you pull you pull the old you pull the old nothing personnel kid and be able to teleport right behind somebody. Um, and I can. The thing, the thing is, is that is that, I remember, my mentor had always said a men, a novelist is shorthand for a bad DM, because a, a lot of people they get hung up on on what these stories are supposed to be and not on the mm -hmm. fact that you are, you are get you are giving people you are not giving people a Lego playset you are giving people the blue bucket, right? We all yeah, have the blue bucket as kids. You're facilitating you're facilitating their story. If it, you if you want to make your own story, just write a book. Mm -hmm. Hence the hence the whole novelist thing. Mm -hmm. um, yep. That's also why I can't get I can't get into a, a lot of um, a lot of art a lot of art games on the video game space. But that's a whole other story. Um, mm -hmm. What would you be? Sh I know you said you've got it. You've got a year. But what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? I know it says June twenty twenty four, but I always I always like to ask these things because not everything is set in stone. Right. So there's a couple of reasons for that, and th this should speak to anybody who is uh, concerned about the, my ability to do a project s solo and with disabilities. Um, when I was looking up Kickstarter and other Kickstarter projects, I, I saw the prevailing theory was, generally speaking, push things a year out. And this was true of all the major hitters. Like I saw Cobalt Press do Kickstarters, they would put it a year out. I would see um, Gr Grim Hollow Games put it, uh, make a Kickstarter for a new book. They put it a year out from the Kickstarter. So generally speaking, I think the expectation for people who are supporting things on Kickstarter is that it will take a year. The other reason I, I, I made sure to make it a year is because some people may legitimately have a concern that being a person who is uh, moderate to severely disabled stops me from being able to be consistently do work on my book. I hear that, right? I, I totally understand that's a concern. I would not have launched this Kickstarter, given that, had I not completed almost the entirety of the book ahead of time. And that reason is, with my disability, there are times where if I overexert myself, I'm out for a week. I'm out for two weeks. I'm out for three weeks. Maybe even more. So I knew what happens if I'm in the middle of making my Kickstarter and I have a, a crash? I, do, I have to, maybe there's an emergency at home and, or something happens or I overexert myself because I, I want to work really hard towards this book and, and it, it makes it so I, I'm out for like three weeks and all I do is just, I put on an eye mask so I don't have to deal with light and then I just do nothing for three weeks. I just rest and recuperate. How does the book work in that, that 
scenario. I, I knew that going in. I knew that that was going to be a, a possibility. So I did it, my work, ahead of time. At this point, my work is finishing the last 5 to 10% of the book that needs to be done, refining that and editorializing it, making sure that it's the best content that it could possibly be, because let's be honest, you can always improve stuff. You can always add extra details. You can always make sure that you're making things as interesting as possible and the cities and the subclasses are refined and balanced. And there's always more time to bring in backers who are playtesting it and hearing their thoughts and opinions and making refinements as I go. But I also have to wear the artist's, uh, the art director's hat because I have seven or eight freelance artists now that I'm, I've hired to be working on this project. And Art takes time. Mm -hmm. Art takes a long time to make. I, I, I have sometimes some of my artists can get one or two projects done in, in a month, and I'm looking at seventy something pieces of art over the course of this, this book. Don't don't quote me on that because budget budgetary concerns are always an issue. But my goal is to make the best possible book that I can make within my ability to do so to try to compete with the big boys because something that's really important to me as a person, as a creator, I I want to make the best book I can possible, but I also know that people who are supporting me are putting in quite a bit of money for this book. So there's a, there's kind of a standard that I, I know I have to meet on top of that, but I, I would like to prove, just maybe even just to myself, that one person's vision if you you work at it hard enough, even through this disability and, and these struggles, can make something that's that's just as good as these these big boys that are putting out these large scale releases. And I kinda I envision my book looking just as good on on, on your shelf or some other player's or DM's shelf as maybe an Eberron Rising of the Last War, or a Taldore Reborn, or or any of these larger Cobalt Press releases, I would, I would really like to make that. I would really like to make a book that somebody can open and look at the world building that I've made and and change it somehow. Mm -hmm. They see what I've done in my foundation, and they're inspired by it, and they go, "I, you know what? I really like." Uh, Breghaven as a city, but you know what? I think I could take it in this direction. Mm -hmm. And once you open up the book, it's yours. It's it's your table's world, and it's your table's story, and it's it becomes something different. And to me, that's something that only D and D is capable of. No other novel or video game or art form is quite like the connection an evolution that we can get of an idea that comes out of Dungeons and Dragons. It is it is dynamic in ways that no other art form is. When you just sit around a table and you, you are collectively creating something new out of nothing with a group that will never be done at any other table. Like if I play a video game, if you and I both play the new Zelda game that came out, Tears of the Kingdom, mm -hmm. we're gonna have we're gonna have somewhat similar experiences. But if you sit down and you, you open up Dratelia, the campaign setting, when I get it done, and I open, and I, I play this, this, this same world with my, my group, we're not going to have the same experience. You're, you're going to look at that, or your DM is going to look at that, and they're going to say, yeah, um, this faction's really cool. I got a really awesome idea. I don't think Drew thought of this, but I'm going to take it in this direction. And you take it in that direction, you do something I never even dreamed of. And maybe I hear about that. I don't know, maybe you post about it on a message board sometime, or now that we've gotten to know each other, maybe you you know, you know call me up and you'd be like, hey, Drew, uh, I got the copy of your book, and uh, you know my DM did this, what do you think? And I go, you know what? That's awesome. That is the coolest experience in the world as a creative to me, in my opinion, to see somebody else tell a different story with something that I made that they made their own. Mm -hmm. That's amazing to me. And, and ultimately, that's, that's my drive. Yeah. for making this book to 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 be able to facilitate that and to put out a little bit of myself and the struggles that I have to deal with this this disability that I have out there 
to inspire other people to do something with the world that might not be what they're they're normally accustomed to. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, hopefully I'll get it done in a year. And you know, you know Miyamoto's quote. Everybody knows Miyamoto's quote uh, for Zelda. A good a good game a or a bad game is no, is bad. For a, a delayed, good game, game, a delayed game is eventually good. A rushed game is yeah. is forever bad. Yeah. So however long it takes me, I will do everything in my power to get it done in that year. But you know, if it doesn't come out in a year, then you know maybe 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 I throw everybody a bone. You know, maybe I maybe I start putting out packets and giving people bits and pieces of of the book here and there to make sure that they're getting the content that they help support. Because honestly. The backers to me, the people who are helping support it from from the word go, they they deserve to be at the ground level getting this stuff first because they they took a chance on one crazy minded wild idea disabled guy who wants to be able to compete with the the heavy hitters and I feel like they should they should be rewarded for that they should they should get some content so. I'll do everything in, in my power to make sure that, that I do right by them. Mm-hmm. And anybody else who buys the book, they should they should get a quality book. That's what I want to do. I want to make something I'm proud of too. Yeah. And I I will certainly be looking forward to it. Oh. I hope so. Yeah. I hope I I do a good job and I I, I make something that uh, you know it's is is worth your guys' time. Mm-hmm. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I I had a blast with this. It was not something that I, I normally do, mm-hmm. but you have facilitated in a very very great environment for just kind of chatting and getting this stuff off my chest and being able to talk about something that I'm really passionate about. Mm -hmm. And, and I feel your passion in it too. And I said before, like what got me here was that 15 second intro that I heard when you asked me to check, check out your stuff. And as soon as I heard that, I was like, you know what? I got to come here. This Mm -hmm. guy's different. This guy's doing something that's just exactly the style that I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to in an interview, and you didn't disappoint. Mm-hmm. This was a lot of fun. And I, pre- I appreciate that. Um, and, of, and, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.